Hey, Anthony, are you ready? Stacy, are you ready? Are you ready, Stace? No. She's, she's no. getting there. Got it. Okay, well, that's why I wanted to check. I want to be sure she's ready before we go. All right. Okay. I call to order the Planning Commission regular meeting for Tuesday, June 23rd, 2020. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we start this meeting, got some background noise. I'm not sure who it is, but if you can just make sure you're on mute. Um, before we start the meeting this evening, I am going to read a, a short thing about how we are doing our meetings during, during the COVID-19 pandemic. In order to practice social distancing, all planning commission meetings are being held virtually mm -hmm. until further notice, which sounds like this may be our last one virtually at this time. We are using a platform called Zoom, which is free for the public and can be accessed via computer, laptop, tablet, or phone. Mm. Citizens can watch and participate in a variety of ways. For the specific details to participate in this meeting, please view the calendar page of the city's website. You will notice we'll do a few things differently due to the virtual format. Commissioners will raise their hand physically or via the Zoom app to speak, and I will call on them. This includes making a motion and seconding it. All votes will be done by roll call, led by Stacy. During the audience input and public hearing portions of tonight's meeting, the public will be able to speak mm -hmm. using the microphone on their device, if using the Zoom web app or their phone. Staff will respond to public questions during the public hearing. This is normally not done until the end of the public hearing, but due to the different format, we are gonna answer them as we go. Letters and emails that were received tonight as part of the public comment will be reviewed at the beginning of each public hearing item. If you are participating online, during the meeting, you will have the option to use the raise your hand feature during portions of tonight's meeting. Staff will call on you at appropriate times. When you enter the meeting, you are asked to register by entering your name and email address. This information along with your address will be required at the start of your public comment. Should you call into the meeting, you can press star six to speak. After you are done speaking, you can exit the meeting by clicking on leave meeting button or hang up the phone and you can continue to watch the meeting on TV or online, or you can choose to stay logged into the Zoom app. As with our normal meetings, we wanna give everyone an opportunity to speak and ask that each person speak once. We ask you have your comments prepared and ready for when it's your turn to speak. If you would like to respond to something after you speak, you may do so, but we ask that you keep your response focused and not reiterate comments that have already been made. I will cover those instructions again when we get to the public hearing portion. If you're having any issues tonight, please use the chat function within Zoom to communicate with us. This is a different format for all of us. And while it's our third or fourth meeting this way, we um, appreciate your patience and support as we continue to learn every month. Okay, and with that, um, are there any additions to tonight's agenda? Nope. Seeing none, we will move on to the audience input. This is for anyone in the audience that would like to address the Planning Commission at this time for items that are not in the public hearing section of tonight's meeting. Anthony, is there anyone in the audience? I don't see anyone. That wants to speak on audience input, thank you. With that, we'll move forward to the consent agenda. Our consent agenda tonight consists of the approval of our May 26th, 2020 regular meeting minutes. Are there any comments from the commissioners on the minutes? Seeing none, I'd entertain a motion. Go ahead, John. You gotta unmute. I think you okay. froze. Looks like John's maybe having some technical difficulties. Is there someone else that wants to give us a motion? Move. Thanks, Michael. Michael has moved. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Gretchen seconds. Stacy, can you take roll? 
Penninger. Aye. Marlowe. Aye. Freeman. Aye. Reed. Aye. Schmizek. Here. Rivera. Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to the next item on our agenda tonight. It's a public hearing item. It's a request by KJ Walk Incorporated for a comprehensive plan amendment, rezoning plan unit development and final site and building plan and preliminary and final plat approval associated with the Rosewood Commons Hotel, senior living mixed use and memory care development. And I will turn that over to Kyle. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I think I'm, I'm going to start with a presentation here and go through the, the details of the request. And, um, you know, after having done this a couple times via the Zoom, I think I'm going to try to take a break occasionally just to see if there's any questions or, or so forth that might come from the Planning Commission. I know it's a little more difficult to present this way, so it's not always possible to read, you know, where individual commissioners may be or what kind of questions you may have. So I will again try to pause a little bit so we can have be able to hopefully answer some questions as they come up or issues uh, as we go through the presentation. Uh, I also want to point out that Warren Israelson, uh, representing the, the applicant, is uh, attending the meeting tonight. You can hopefully see him on, on your screen here. Uh, so he'll also be able to address questions and uh, further comment on the applications that are in front of the commission tonight. So with that, I'm going to try to switch over to my presentation here now. So I'm going to share my screen and I will put up. Um, okay, looks like I'm disabled from sharing. Uh, can our host get me set up to share screen? I don't know if Anthony, that's you. Yeah, I'm seeing here if I can. Hmm, that's weird. That hasn't shown up before. Okay. I'm gonna try it one more time here. Yeah, so I'm getting a message saying host disabled attendees. Here. Okay. You should be able to do it now. There we go. Okay, are you all seeing the screen now? Yep. Okay, so you should see the title slide for the presentation. Excellent. Okay, so I'll get started here. So uh, the request in front of the commission tonight is to consider a request from KJ Walk, who's the applicant. And then there's several components to this request as are detailed out in the staff report. And I'll try to summarize here as we go through the application, but it includes these, these I think it's five different components, a comprehensive plan amendment, a zoning map amendment, a PUD master development plan, a final development plan and then a preliminary plan. And we'll talk about these in a little more detail here as we go along. Uh, but the basic premise is that these uh, applications are going to or will facilitate the development of the site uh, for the three things you see here. Uh, the first component is a 79 unit hotel complex. Uh, the next is 124 senior apartment units. Uh, and then finally a 32 unit memory care facility. Now, as I note here at the start of the presentation, the applicant has withdrawn the memory care portion of the request prior to the meeting. Uh, as you'll note from the staff report, staff was recommending denial of the request for the memory care portion of this application uh, with the approval of the other components. So uh, by and large, the staff report was divided up into two different kind of sections, one detailing the recommendation for the sections that were recommended for approval, and then the other section dealing with the memory care that was recommended for denial. So by withdrawing the request, it actually uh, fits fairly well with the way that the, the uh, presentation and, and the report was structured. Uh, so you're not going to see, um, you know, in terms of the information in your packet, uh, this changing a lot of the way it was uh, structured and, and brought forward. Um, so in terms of the presentation tonight, then I will not be doing any or presenting any information that was in your packet regarding the memory care facility. Since again, that part of the application is withdrawn. There are still some plans and, and uh, details in the report that uh, reference the memory care facility. Some of the, uh, the site plans also still include that. I'll point that out where I can, but uh, um, you know, we're not um, you know, just completely throwing it away. We're recognizing that this isn't uh, part of the application at this time, and so that's, that's off. So um, if there are any questions about that, please let me know as we go through the, the report, or if there's some question about where exactly that memory care falls in relation to the other parts of the application, I'm happy to address it uh, as we work through this. Uh, so this is the site location map uh, that you have in the packet. This is just illustrating the location of the property. Uh, so the, the site that's uh, under consideration tonight is shown in the red highlighting right here. Uh, this site is located at the intersection of 150th Street or Highway 42 
uh, which runs east and west shown here with the arrow uh, on the property and also is adjacent to um, State Highway 3 running north and south, which is the yellow highlighted line here, and also the Progressive Rail Rail Line, which runs kind of north, uh, east, to southwest throughout the community. So this is that line right here. Um, it is located within a subdivision that was uh, called Rosemount Estates, that at the time uh, that was approved included uh, this site, but also a lot of the residential property you see further to the north here, uh, both on the north and south sides of this rail spur that comes off of the progressive rail line. Uh, that subdivision also included uh, some of the commercial land that's outside the scope of this application uh, between 149th Street and then 150th Street. And I think I have your pictures up here, but at the very far end of the, um, uh, the, the, the map here, uh, this is Biscayne Avenue. Um, going down to, uh, both north and south in the community, uh, further south of 42 and then all the way up to 145th Street up here. Uh, the next slide, I do have a little more uh, up to date. Uh, let me see here, get out of here. Bear with me here as I figure this out. All right, uh, so the next slide then, is just a, a little more up to date air photograph showing the same thing without the highlighting. So again, the site we're looking at are the, the two, three larger sites you see here, um, um, both all of this uh, uh, mostly to the um, west of Business Parkway, which is the road that comes into the site, running north and south here uh, across Highway 42. Uh, so as we talk about the memory care, the memory care was limited to the property that was um, east of, of Highway, uh, I'm sorry, east of um, Business Parkway. So it's roughly a 2.2 acre site right here. So this is outside the scope of what we're talking about tonight because that part of the request is withdrawn. We'll be focusing on that the eastern portion of the property. Uh, the other thing that we'll, we'll talk about as we go through the application is the fact that um, all of this, the area that uh, we're looking at that's, that's undeveloped and as part of this request uh, has been uh, guided and zoned for commercial development. Um, that was a change from the very initial approval of this, this uh, subdivision, which was approved back in 2001. Uh, shortly after that approval, the city did change the uh, area for these undeveloped parcels to commercial. So that includes, again, both these sites uh, to the west of Business Parkway and all the property along Highway 42 that's right along, um, or to the east of Business Parkway and north of Highway 42. Uh, so that's just kind of setting the stage here for the request. We can come back to this if there's some questions about uh, what's going on in the area or the, the properties around this, this particular development. Uh, moving on then to the next uh, part of the request, breaking the, the individual components of the request down a little bit uh, more. Uh, so the, the, the first request in front of the, the commission is a conference of plan amendment. Um, so right now, as I said, all the property that uh, is subject to the application is currently guided for commercial development. And the applicant's proposing to change the future land use uh, of this, this uh, particular portion of the site from uh, CC, which is community commercial to the city's high density residential zoning designation. Uh, this ends up being roughly 5.5 acres that are west of Business Parkway. Um, then going along with that is a zoning map amendment. Uh, like the commercial um, guidance of the property, all of the property has been zoned to, to commercial uh, and for commercial development, as we'll see on the maps in just a second. The applicant, uh, like the comp plan change, is proposing to change that zoning from the city's C4, which is our general commercial zoning district, uh, with a PUD overlay to R4, uh, which is our high density residential district with a similar PUD type overlay. Uh, so again, that's the same 5.5 acres uh, that is the request um, for the comp plan amendment. So kind of going to the maps then, uh, these two maps, next two maps show those areas or show those um, uh, what's being considered as part of the land use request. Uh, the first uh, map here is showing the, the comprehensive plan guidance for the property, both the existing and then proposed future land use will be. So just to highlight this here, uh, the area that's shown here is the area that's west of Business Parkway that is presently um, guided for commercial development in our conference of plan. Uh, the proposed change would change that area to high density residential. Uh, so only the area shown in the dark brown color here would be changed to that high density residential category. Uh, their request as it was initially ap applied to the city included uh, the property east of Business Parkway down here, this two and a half two to two and a half acre parcel, which was previously guided commercial, um, which would have been changed to high density residential. And again, that's off the table. So really we're focusing on this change right here tonight. Uh, kind of consistent with that, the city is also considering a zoning change or is being asked to consider a zoning change, which would change the, the zoning from the commercial to the um, high density residential category. So you see the same exact area here uh, that is presently zoned um, commercial 
that would be changed to the high density residential um, zoning district if the application were approved by the city. Uh, just one other comment is that when the overall uh, subdivision was approved by the city, that was approved through a plan development process. So you'll see there's the hatch marks which indicate that this area already is subject to that Rosemount Estates uh, PUD. Uh, this, by adopting a new plan development for the site, if this is approved, uh, that would take precedence and now that would, that PUD zoning would, would uh, take precedent and would be applicable to the site. So maybe I'll, I'll pause there for a second and just see if there's any questions about the kind of background um, land use changes that are proposed as part of this application. And Kyle, so just, just for clarification sake, so when that, when the Rosemont Estates was first built and the homeowners moved in there, um, the uh, area in question here that was already zoned for commercial, is that correct? When the entire area was initially um, platted and approved by the city, it was um, guided for residential development and zoned for residential development. Th about three years after that initial approval, the city did change the zoning of the parcels you see here shown in red to the commercial designation. So certainly not all of the, the subdivision was built out at that time um, because of the short time that it was um, between that approval and that change. And um, you know, going back into the records, there was some conversation discussion about the appropriate zoning for these parcels. And ultimately the city did decide that these should be commercial given their proximity to Highway 42 and the limited amount of, of commercial land that was available and, and still is available in the community at this time. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So any other questions about the comp plan background zoning for the property? Okay, so don't keep moving on then. So the next part of the request then is, is the uh, plan development application. So the uh, applicant is requesting a planned unit development, master development plan, or a preliminary development plan for the property with a rezoning, which would change the zoning to the PUD designation, uh, along with a final development plan. So under our uh, zoning regulations, an applicant can move forward with both steps in that PUD process, provided they submit the detailed uh, plans and documents necessary for the city to take action that way. And the applicant has uh, provided those detailed plans and you'll see those in your packet and we'll go through those here in a little bit. So there are two primary components under the PUD that's in front of the, the, the planning commission tonight. The first is a, um, a approval for a 79 unit hotel, which would be on the commercial portion of the site or the site that's not subject to the reguiding and rezoning, which retains its commercial designation. Uh, secondly, there's a proposal for 124 senior apartments that would be uh, split between four 21 unit buildings, uh, two 20 unit buildings that have retail on their ground floor. Um, and then all of that would be on the property that's being reguided and rezoned to high density residential. Um, as I note here, the PUD ordinance in this particular instance allows for that mix of uses and activities that wouldn't normally be allowed within one development plan. Uh, and more specifically in this case, allows for the high density residential component to include a, a retail uh, component on that ground level. Uh, whereas under a traditional zoning, the city would not allow a mix of those types of uses within one structure. Uh, the PUD further allows sharing a parking between the, the two, those uses described here so that overall the applicant has brought forward a plan that provides the, the minimum parking required for all uses combined, but then would be sharing that parking and have it available for both those uses uh, between properties on common space. Uh, and then finally, the PUD allows for flexibility from the city's zoning standards. Um, so in the case of this type of request, uh, it allows the applicant to plat um, the individual building separately uh, with common open space that's owned by an association that will be responsible for that maintenance. Uh, whereas the, the city's typical zoning would require each building to have an individual site and have meet individual setbacks and, and those sorts of things. So as you go through the site plan here, we'll, we'll kind of explain that and show you what that looks like um, on the ground with the proposed uh, plan that's in front of the city. Uh, the other kind of last component of the request would be a preliminary plat. Uh, this would be uh, for a development called the Rosewood Commons. Uh, this would allow the platting of these individual spaces. As I said earlier, it would allow the platting of the common open space around each building. But then the applicant would also reserve 15 acres um, as an outlet that could be used for future development. Um, and the applicant has given the city a concept plan for the entire site that shows um, additional commercial development uh, further west on the site, in addition to some other areas for high density housing that would be subject to further requests for changes to the plan um, if that were to move forward in that manner. Uh, the memory care facility is part of the preliminary plat. Um, however, that could be you know, dropped from the final plat moving forward 
if the other components are approved and then that could be picked up at some point again or developed as it's currently platted um, right now. So then I'd like to spend some time going through the plans that, that are in your packet uh, and that show the details for the application. Um, you know, we're gonna start, I think, by going through the general overall site plan and then getting to some of the, the architectural details of each building uh, separately. Uh, so with that, I, I will just kind of go through the, um, some of these details with you. Um, so starting off with then, um, there's several different sets of applications um, or types of, of uh, plans in your packet. Some show the overall site uh, with things happening in and around the property. Some are specific to certain components of the request. And then lastly, we have you know, the detailed architectural plans for each of the specific uh, um, buildings and uh, facilities that are proposed with this application. The applicant has provided some updates to these plans based on initial conversations with staff and comments that, that uh, were, were sent back to them regarding the request. Uh, so in particular, I think some of the details concerning the hotel and apartment site uh, do have updated plans that reflect some of those comments. So I'll again highlight those as we go through. There's other parts of the plan haven't been updated. So this initial overview plan, for instance, does not include some of the more details and, and amendments that were done within the interior of the hotel and apartment site. Uh, so as we look at these, we'll be talking on a more general term in nature about the entire development and then moving into more specifics as those various plans come forward. Uh, so just to get us oriented again here, so um, Highway 42 or 150th Street is the major road here that goes uh, east and west. This is a, a, a four-lane divided highway. Uh, Business Parkway is the main entrance coming into the site, uh, which then uh, winds up to the north here, uh, comes back around, then we'll eventually uh, head north and, and connect on to 145th Street uh, further to the north here. Um, the other major kind of east-west route on the property, I believe, is 149th Street. Uh, this is the east-west road that connects into Business Parkway and eventually connects over to uh, Biscayne Avenue further on the eastern portion of the property. Um, all other uh, kind of roads shown here are all existing roads that are um, were platted and built for the residential development uh, adjacent to this particular property. So then the, uh, oh, just to kind of further illustrate here, the, the other kind of major components are the railroad lines here on the western part of the property. Uh, those rail lines uh, uh, um, tee off or split off into a spur line uh, coming north of the project site. And you'll see several kind of um, spur lines that, that uh, come off of that as well. Uh, those are used on a limited basis, uh, as I'm sure the, the residents in the neighborhood can tell you that those are used for storage at times, uh, but those are still part of the active use of the railroad in and around this particular property. Uh, so this is showing you um, what would look like, what the overall concept plan would look like. Uh, so it includes the two areas that were subject to the original PUD, and most importantly, the, the one area we're looking at tonight with the hotel and senior apartments, but then also shows you what the applicant has uh, considered and will be considering for development south and uh, west of this, this planned unit development. Uh, so with this, you also see that, um, you know, these plans indicate what the existing stormwater situation is in the area, where those stormwater ponds are, and then the grading plan ultimately will show kind of how those all connect and what they'll look like uh, moving forward. So I'm looking on here, uh, the next uh, um, document or next uh, plan that's in front of us is, is a preliminary plat. Uh, this is the actual plat for the property that would, would split the lot into lots and out lots. Uh, as I said, the, the primary components of the, the preliminary plat are going to be the creation of these individual building pads uh, for the hotel and for the senior apartment site, uh, the common space between those areas, and then this larger outlot uh, to the west and to the south of the planned development area. Uh, the memory here, again, is not part of the application moving forward, so presumably this would not be part of any final plat uh, approval moving forward and should probably be dropped from the uh, preliminary plat if, if approved and, and moved on to the city council. Next plan shows the grading plan. As I alluded to earlier, this is a little more close up view of the property. Um, it's giving you an indication as to where the storm sewer is going and how that connects into the regional ponding system. Uh, this particular site is part of a larger, larger um, regional stormwater collection system that was put in place with the Rosemont Estates edition uh, and has been designed to accommodate uh, the stormwater runoff from this site. Uh, one of the things you'll, you'll see in the staff report and that was commented on by our city engineer and stormwater consultant is that the uh, standards and requirements for stormwater ponding have changed uh, since that initial plat was approved by the city. Uh, so ultimately there's a potential that the site will need to accommodate additional retention and stormwater ponding on the property. Uh, as of right now, the site is capable of handling the additional capacity for you know, this addition to that overall development project. 
uh, but ultimately may need to be um, revised or um, amended to accommodate additional stormwater runoff, depending on those models and how those shake out with the rest of the development in the area. So as you can see here, basically what's happening is, is a lot of the stormwater pond, or a lot of the stormwater uh, for the area is going into pond, this pond here, um, going through the development and ultimately ends up on a pond just to the um, east of the proposed memory care facility. Um, the city has talked to the developer about some options for expanding ponding on the site, which may include a slight expansion of the pond east of the uh, memory care facility. It may include um, directing some of that stormwater into a pond that's south of Highway 42 that is also connected to this pond down here. Uh, so I think the takeaway for the, for the planning question here is that in terms of the um, proposal that's in front of the commission tonight, uh, there's adequate capacity to handle the stormwater uh, for that site. Uh, it's part of the overall design for the subdivision. But then as these future phases come forward, there will need to be further conversations about how to best accommodate uh, the additional requirements for stormwater runoff within the, this project area. Um, then the next plan here is a more detailed view of the hotel and then the apartment uh, site. Uh, this is the plan that has been updated uh, based on staff comments. And I'll kind of talk about some of those changes as we look at this plan here. Uh, but the basic uh, components of this plan would be um, Business Parkway running north and south here, which is in, in place right now. Uh, there would be a new access drive serving primar primarily the, the new commercial development uh, in the uh, lower portion of the apartments or the southern portion of the apartments. Uh, the hotel would be located right here. Uh, this is the part of the site that would retain that, that commercial designation. Then you'll see here we have a series of six uh, buildings uh, going from lot one, two, three, four, five, and then seven. Uh, that would house these 20 or 21 unit apartment buildings. Uh, lots number five and seven would be the buildings that accommodate retail on the ground floor, uh, while the first four uh, lots up here would be buildings that are, um, would uh, be 21 units without that ground floor retail. So the overall concept um, that's been brought forward by the applicant is that this would have uh, somewhat of a um, urban village type feel uh, what the applicant is, has been trying to do with the project is keep the buildings close to uh, the driveways and, and parking areas and ex access lanes throughout the development, again, to mimic this kind of downtown or more urban feel. Uh, so all the buildings you see here on, along this north-south uh, driveway corridor are all brought up close to the street uh, with parking in front of those buildings, similar to a situation you might find in a downtown uh, that has on-street parking. Uh, overall, um, you'll see um, with the surface parking anyway, it's set up in a way so that these various uses will have access to the parking um, and be available for each of these uses individually. The individual senior buildings, again, the labeled here is one through eight, uh, would have uh, parking on their ground level. Uh, they would not have parking underground uh, due to the kind of close proximity of the buildings to the, uh, to the access drives and just the fact that these are smaller buildings uh, that wouldn't have the same capacity to handle um, the, the space and the separation needed for underground parking. Uh, but the applicant is proposing to keep some of those parking stalls on that first floor level. So you would have a uh, drive or a garage entrance into the parking garage, which would be at ground level uh, with an apartments uh, starting above that with the exception of the uh, units in the north part uh, where there would be a ground floor uh, apartment in place of a commercial uh, development or commercial um, tenant space. And as we get into the floor plans, I can show you what those look like for each of the buildings separately. That probably comes through a little better than trying to look at this plan. Uh, I would note that these individual, um, oops, sorry, just get plans here. Uh, the individual garage entrances all face towards this internal north-south street system. So you see these entrances here um, going into the building. Uh, and likewise down here, uh, those entrances are shown here. Um, Part of what the applicant or part of what staff requested the applicant look at doing with the request in order to better accommodate you know parking that could be shared between the uses but also to uh, better structure this the north south street in particular as a, a primary uh, mode of travel throughout this this project uh, is it was to uh, change the parking here between the the hotel and the senior building to parallel um, per, i'm sorry um, angled parking uh, whereas the applicant had previously been showing um, 90 degree parking like you see up here. So this you know, should promote um, more efficient uh, travel of vehicles here and actually provide some additional space for parking above and beyond what the 90 degree parking allows for. Uh, staff also worked with the applicant on, on kind of uh, an access plan down here, whereas the applicant initially had access very close to the business parkway entrance. Uh, that's been reconfigured to shift these buildings a little further north to create a small parking lot here. 
So again, especially with the commercial activity on ground level of, of these buildings, uh, staff found it uh, beneficial to have that surface parking available in close proximity to the building to help support that commercial uh, development and commercial project. Uh, plus this also provides parking, um, potentially some overflow parking for the hotel. That's fairly close proximity to the hotel. Uh, staff also requested that no parking be allowed on that initial leg of the uh, primary access into the commercial area heading east and west uh, to help ensure that there's uh, adequate flow of vehicles coming into and out of this area. Uh, we would point out that the ultimate plan for this area is for this road to continue onwards into the larger commercial area back here and provide access to other apartments and other future developments uh, further west on the project site. And then lastly, um, staff had recommended that um, the applicants in, you know, as a change from the applicant's initial plan, uh, which called for unrestricted turning movements here at this Northern driveway uh, to revise the plans to limit this to a three quarters intersection uh, and specifically to eliminate the ability for people in the Northern part of the uh, project area here that are exiting um, through this private driveway to turn North and, and go into the residential neighborhood to uh, get out uh, further to the um, east or out to 145th Street. Uh, so again, this would limit any turning movements coming out of the project to only right out uh, and then down south on Business Parkway. Uh, so what's shown here would only be an entrance into the, the project site, either via cars coming from the north and turning right into the project or cars coming from the south and then turning left into it as well. So essentially this little road here acts as a one way into the project. Uh, this road down here acts as a one way segment out of the project area. So I have some numbers uh, kind of based on the site plan later in the presentation to talk about how, how this complies or, or maybe doesn't comply with some of our zoning standards. So I'll, I'll save some of those details for later. Um, and then I think we can come back to this as questions come up about uh, the siting of these, these uh, structures and how they're oriented and so forth. Uh, before I move on to the next slide, I, I do wanna also talk a little bit about the, the applicant's um, strategy or proposal um, as it's been explained to staff. Uh, I think, as you'll see with this plan, there's several areas that, that call for open space between two of the buildings. Uh, so again, between these first two buildings, there's open space, and between these two, there's a larger area of open space. Uh, that was intentionally done by the applicant to, um, again, as it was explained to staff, uh, to try to or be, able, be able to orient the building so that many of the units are overlooking this common over space. Uh, and as we'll see in some of the floor plans and elevation drawings, each of these buildings does have a roof deck that would overlook this common open space. Uh, and so I think the applicant feels this is a um, good way to promote some density in the community while still preserving some open space and providing some views and um, amenities for the immediate area uh, that would otherwise not be possible. Um, so again, I'm sure we'll come back to this drawing as we continue to talk through this. Uh, and with that, I think I'll take another pause here and see if there's any questions about uh, some of the sites and, and other plans that you have, or these site plans specifically that, that are in, in your packet tonight. Kyle, I just had one um, question and I apologize for not asking you this earlier. I just noticed it again when I was doing some reading right before the meeting, um, rereading of the traffic study. The traffic study indicated that that north entrance was gonna be a right in, right out. But it sounds like um, from your presentation, it is um, a three quarters where they could go left or right in. Yes. I think okay. the, way it's the way it's shown in the plans is three quarters access so that you could turn left uh, coming into the project site. Uh, there'd have to be some additional restrictions or, or modification of this to, you know, structure it in a way that wouldn't, wouldn't allow uh, those left turning movements into the site. Yeah, I just uh, thought it was in the traffic study that it called it out as a yeah. right in, right out, which would limit the, which would force the, the traffic to that area to turn left at 149th versus going um, you know, kind of into the neighborhood or yeah. kind of by the houses on Brenner Court there. Yeah, and that certainly could have been a discrepancy in, in the traffic study, the way it was presented. Uh, as we said, the applicant has been updating his plans. This was one of the latter updates that they incorporated uh, in order to address some of those staff review comments. Kyle, I've got a quick question too. Um, since we're talking about the orientation of the buildings, you know, some of the concerns from the residents, of course, is the privacy in there backyards. I'm assuming with the orientation of these buildings that helps minimize the number of apartments and so on that would be overlooking the residential areas where the where they 
want privacy? Um, I think that's correct. And we'll probably talk, I can show you some more details with the floor plans and the elevation drawings, you know, what that looks like. Um, so I, I know that's something that uh, the applicant had considered when putting together these plans about how to best uh, promote and provide some additional opportunities for senior housing in the community, uh, but also do something that's a little more unique than maybe some of the other projects we've seen. Uh, so I know they were a little concerned about, you know, doing one larger building that would have, you know, essentially an uninter uninterrupted um, wall or row of windows facing towards the residential area uh, versus this site, this concept, which would um, allow for a higher building than what we would allow under our zoning regulations, but then would have this, this additional open space in between. So I think as, as we move through this, I, I'm sure the applicant can talk a little more about, uh, you know, their rationale for why they thought this would be a better design and what their some of their objectives are in, in doing this and maybe even highlight some of those questions about uh, the units where they're facing and what they were trying to do. Well, a couple of questions. The, uh, the primary traffic for the hotel portion would be 149th, right? Be coming in at that entrance. I, I think you're correct. I, 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 staff has, has looked at this and spent some time, you know, again, working with our traffic consultants and it certainly would appear that any the majority of the traffic coming to that hotel site is going to come up uh, from 42 use business parkway and then turn into that, that main entrance there doesn't seem to be a lot of reason for that traffic to be coming up further north and turning in um, i don't want to try to presume what different people are doing and how they drive but certainly that that's the intent and that was part of the reason why staff really worked with the applicant to try to ensure that that area here uh, that's coming into the commercial area is left unobstructed without you know parallel parking and other things going on there to really enhance and, and promote the flow of traffic in that location uh, versus other portions of the site. And I don't know if there's many considerations yet, but likely there could be some signage or something to direct that traffic in that, in that particular entrance, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, the other question I had, I, and, um, this was at the towards the bottom of the packet, and I think it was the uh, the county uh, response about the traffic and it said something in there about the potential for the um, exit from the parkway onto 42nd potentially being considered for a three-quarter exit mm -hmm. is that can you clarify what that was about does that mean that um, they may prevent at some point left turns off the of business parkway heading west i'm sorry eastbound on 42. I believe so. Um, I think what you're referencing is the co county has adopted an overall, um, I don't call it a staging plan, but improvement plan for Highway 42, working with, working in conjunction with the city. Um, and what their plan ultimately calls for is a three quarters um, access at Business Parkway and then a full um, um, stoplight or controlled intersection at Business Parkway. And so um, I go back to maybe one of our their drawings here. I'm sorry, Kyle, could you say that again? The I think you said the stoplight would be at Business Parkway. I'm, I'm sorry, Biscayne yeah. Avenue. Yeah. So again, there would be a three quarters. I mean, the, the county's plans call for a three quarters access at Business Parkway, which is this leg right here. And then a, a fully controlled intersection or stoplight at Biscayne Avenue. Oh, sorry if I got my roads mixed up. No, no, no. So anyone, anyone who's leaving the hotel or the apartments there, eventually, um, to go eastbound on 42, they would need to take 149th over to Biscayne and then out the light on a 42, right? That is correct. Okay. But you'd still have movements that could come in from the um, east and go north. Mm -hmm. And likewise, coming from the west and going north, it would just be those leaving then would be limited to that right turning movement. And you wouldn't be allowed to turn left coming out here. Did, 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 did our traffic studies take into account that particular flow or are there any concerns there? At, at this point, no. It really only looked at what the existing conditions were. And as we note, as, as part of the traffic study, uh, you know, at this point, we're really not able to, to get good numbers for what the traffic flow is with the COVID situation and so forth. So we don't have that level of detail in, in, the, in the report. So the, the purpose of the traffic study was mostly to look at, you know, what what the expected traffic counts are going to be from this development uh, and mostly compare that to the numbers or the counts that would have uh, happened had the site and were the site to develop for commercial development using you know a past model or concept that was uh, considered by the city. Okay. 
So ultimately, I mean, that's been one of the issues that that, that uh, the city and, and our staff has talked with potential developers about concerning, you know, particular, you know, development of co commercial at uh, either these uh, in, at this intersection. Uh, it's just what those those turning movements me mean. And I, I know we've had some folks that have said or some potential um, commercial users there express some concern about that that limited access. But ultimately, uh, the site and the area has been set up so that 149th Street provides that outlet uh, so that cars you know, can continue those movements uh, without going too far out of their way. Hey, Kyle, I don't know if now is the, the time to ask it, but since we're talking about the road and the traffic um, and the access, I, I will, and if you'd rather wait till later to discuss it, we can, but um, at one point when this land changed from the residential zoning to commercial, there was conversation of, of kind of dead ending um, business parkway around the Brenner Court area and then um, therefore separating the traffic um, that comes from this development and restricting it from going through the neighborhood via that. Um, and so I just wondered, obviously, you know, this is a just a portion of the development here, but as the rest of the area gets developed, you know, from the commercial traffic study to to this, I, I think it was an 8% at morning and 10% reduction at night or vice versa from what the commercial was gonna generate. Um, it, you know, is there, so with how we're looking at doing that second access north there, what is the possibility of changing that as this gets, as the rest of the area develops? Maybe I can hit on it real quickly and then we can save that to some further conversations as we look at some of the other the plans and we talk about the traffic study in particular. Um, I, I think at this point staff would not recommend uh, disconnecting the road uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but I think, um, you know, based on what we've seen with some of the traffic studies and the expected traffic flow, um, it doesn't appear that that would be something that would um, significantly alter the, the, the traffic patterns through this area. Um, but also would limit, you know, access throughout this, this area and this neighborhood, both from the residents that maybe live further to the north that want to go south uh, and vice versa from, you know, folks in this development that need to, to move up there. You know, as we look at traffic and access, we look at a number of things, including, you know, the ability of service vehicles to get access into a neighborhood, emergency vehicles, um, you know, what the road was designed to handle and accommodate and, and all those sorts of things. So I think Staff ultimately would have some concerns about the creation of a, a really long cul-de-sac in this location that isn't connected and doesn't provide that uh, that connectivity between the various neighborhoods. So, you know, I think we can maybe highlight some of the numbers uh, that we have in the in traffic study, look at those a little more closely. Um, but, you know, that, that certainly is something we can talk about a little further here as we, we talk about this, this application. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue on then, and we'll look at uh, actually one more plan here before we get into some of the architectural plans. Uh, so this is another plan that the applicant did provide some updates to um, prior to the meeting. Uh, this is the landscape plan, which shows their overall plan for providing landscaping within the project area. As you'll see from some of the staff comments in the report, uh, the plan itself is far is well short of, of meeting the minimum requirements for landscaping numbers and you know, based on the area of the project and the city's requirement for a certain number of overstory trees based on that area. So uh, if I remember the numbers right, the applicant is proposing 54 overstory trees, the city would require 154. So there's a, at least 100 more trees that should be incorporated as part of this project in order to meet the city's minimum requirements. Um, in looking at the plan the applicants brought forward, one of the things that they did um, work towards and are accomplishing with this plan is providing additional screening and buffering of trees along the business parkway corridor uh, to help provide some additional separation and screening between uh, the taller, uh, higher density um, senior family or senior living apartments uh, from the single family area over to the um, east here in this part of the site. Um, I think the plan certainly uh, because of its, its uh, nature um, allows for some additional opportunities to provide more landscaping with additional trees with more um, separation between those uses uh, and then just some additional areas within the site that could be um, accommodate additional uh, landscaping. Uh, you also see in the staff report that um, you know the applicant is proposing and has several interior parking lot islands and um, uh, areas within the parking lot that could count towards their minimum requirements for interior parking lot landscaping. 
we just don't have the calculations from them to, to verify that those are in compliance with our standards. We require a certain percentage of the parking lot be set aside for landscaping. And so we would need to do another check on that. That would be one of the conditions of approval that are recommended by staff. With that, there's some area or opportunities to plant some additional trees within the parking areas, which will also help soften the impact of these larger um, you know, paved areas within the project. Uh, the other thing we, we point out, and I don't think I called out this specifically in the staff report, is that um, the city requires a certain percentage of the trees to be coniferous or evergreen trees that provide year-round screening. Uh, there are not a lot of those types of trees in the plan. I think the only ones show up down here next to the memory care facility. Uh, so that's another area where the landscape plan could be improved to help provide uh, year-round screening uh, between these, these different uses and activities out here. And then finally, in regards to the landscaping, um, our planning question chair had pointed out that with some of the projects, we did note that there is a requirement in the code that uh, where you have a parking lot of over six vehicles, the city requires an, uh, a screen of, of opacity of 90%. Uh, you know, between that and any residential um, districts, uh, so we definitely have a lineup here between a parking area and a residential zone. So as part of the recommendation moving forward, staff certainly would would um, recommend and require. Uh, or recommend requiring that there be that type of screen or a more heavily buffered screen up here between this home and then this parking area up in the northern part of the site. Would, it, would we need to include that as a condition on our I think you house? can, just to clarify that particular component of the request, that they um, are expected to meet that requirement of, of a, a screen between parking areas and the residential uses. That or I think one of the other options that we can consider tonight too is, um, is continuing this item until we see some of those updated plan is another option as well to move forward. Can I ask a follow-up question on that, Melissa, or are you or Chair? Yeah, <laughs> Get it oh, go ahead. Um, I was curious too, um, Kyle, whether um, on, on the Eastern side there, uh, on the residential side, um, have we had plans before similar to this where uh, we've had conditions to add any landscaping on the residential side. So I, I'm thinking of the house that's on the north side of uh, the court there, for example, and, and their, their, their western boundary on that road uh, kind of opened up and so on. Does the city own an easement there? Is, is there something that we might consider to, to require some landscaping there as part of this? I mean, generally the answer is no. Um, the city wouldn't oppose conditions that the applicant has to um, put things or put trees or plantings on an adjacent property or not, you know, probably it's not part of the development. Uh, we would typically look at the, the project area and assign conditions based on that. Um, yeah, so I was thinking, I, I, I kind of understand that their property, but I mean, do we, does the city own an easement there? And would the city consider um, adding some landscaping on the easement as part of this? Yeah, there's a boulevard there. Mm -hmm. And so I'll go back to the air photograph. That'll maybe show a little more clearly. Yeah, maybe it doesn't. Generally, the, the right of way is going to end about a foot in back of that, that sidewalk. And then with this particular development and how it's done, there's sidewalks on both sides. So I don't believe there's there's a lot of room uh, to provide additional, you know, boulevard plantings or landscapings in this particular project area. Um, and then in general, the city has not required or not been requiring trees in the boulevard. Uh, with newer single family homes and other developments, we've been requiring those trees to be planted on the property that's subject to the development. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically off the sidewalk you know, on, the, on the private property versus going into the boulevard area. Kyle, I, I think Michael brings up an interesting, interesting question with that though. If, if the homeowners were open to it, could the applicant plant some trees in certain areas to provide buffering and have that count towards their total? So it wouldn't necessarily be that the trees on their property, but if if those homes and Michael, I'm not sure which which lot you were necessarily talking about of those, but um, if the homeowners were open to something like that and mm -hmm. providing space, is that would that be able to count towards their total? Exactly, and I I, I didn't use I didn't know the right word, but the boulevard, I guess, is what I was thinking. Is if there's something there, if there we we could work with them, and yeah, if that would be a an option we'd want to consider. Yeah, two comments there. I think it wouldn't be, I mean, to plant trees like that wouldn't be inconsistent with our overall plans or requirements for landscaping where we have, you know, houses next to roads that are more heavily traveled or even in our typical subdivision where we require plantings along the road. Uh, then secondly, I think in concept that could work if you had the agreement of those property owners. 
Uh, there still will need to be some details worked out about, you know, being able to get in there and actually plant the trees and, and access once they're established, those sorts of things where they need to do maintenance work or something. But, you know, I, I think in theory, if there's some, um, if those property owners are agreeable to that, that's certainly something that, that would, could, you know, maybe work with this project. You know, Madam Chair. Yes, yes. I, I'm just going to jump in here. I, I'm a little uncomfortable about um, trying to mitigate on somebody else's property, um, in part because we don't have any control over the the, the installation after. Um, you know, somebody could cut it down at any time. Um, you know, we're not going to restrict it. Um, you know, I I think. I think our first choice would be to always screen on the new proposal because we have better control, particularly in this situation where you're going to have an HOA. And so there's more control over the long-term viability of the landscaping in the, in the manner by which we approved it. Um, I, I'm honestly trying to think of a time when we've ever required somebody to landscape on someone else's property. And I don't think, um, I'm not coming up with any. I think there's been occasions when uh, people have made a side agreement with the property owner or the developer has wanted to work with the neighborhood, but it was outside of the approvals that the city had conditioned or that the conditions of approval were outside of the city, just because um, there's more control. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we're now um, as we had a conversation about the brewery, um, we can't require. How do we require somebody to put landscaping on somebody else's property he doesn't control? And what happens if the neighbor says no? Oh, now he can't meet the conditions of approval. I mean, it just it's um, certainly doable but it's probably not preferred. Thank you. Any other questions at this time from the commission? Okay, thanks Kyle, I'll let you proceed. Just have, oh. I just have one comment. Go ahead Gretchen. I noticed it on the landscaping plan, it lists Colorado blue spruce. And I think I mentioned this on like some other um, application some time ago, but um, I know that that particular tree isn't recommended for Minnesota landscape. So I just thought I'd point that out. Like if any future landscape plans come through, I think there should be probably a different evergreen tree for that. I know if you look at the U of M extension site, you can find more information on that. They're just really susceptible to disease. So I just wanna point that out. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point too. Um... In addition to that, the uh, landscape plan does include ash trees as well. Uh, those are not recommended by our parks department in terms of uh, tree species in the community. So that's another one that would need to be adjusted. I think we did comment on that, the ash tree specifically in our staff report. So the expectation would be that any future landscape plans should remove those. And we'll certainly bring up the blue spruce as well. Um, I'm sorry. So just one final comment on the landscape plan. The only other example I can think of um, with offsite planting of trees was, um, you know, we do have some cases where developers just can't because of physical space provide enough trees to meet our requirements. Uh, in those cases, we have allowed some to plant trees offsite, but it's always been in on city parkland, essentially where they're required to do that and allowed to do that. Thanks, Kyle. Any other questions for staff before we proceed forward? Just one question on the uh, the retail space option. Are there any limitations on the type of retail that would be able to go in there? Well, there's space limitations, but otherwise, other than that, yeah, it would be limited to those uses that are allowed within our C4 district, since that would be the zoning for the property. Um, I could certainly read a list of those particular activities, but um, yeah, so it would be limited to those those the, the zoning that that's in place. Thanks. Any other questions for staff at this time before we proceed forward? Okay, Kyle, we'll turn it back to you. Okay. So I think the next uh, set of plans uh, are these are the architectural plans for the, the project, both the hotel and, and the senior living. I'd also like to just go through those and, and talk a little bit about, about that before we move on to the other um, kind of section of our staff report. 
so this this is a drawing showing the the hotel plans um both from the uh, west south north and then the east elevations down here uh, so in terms of orientation uh, this is the elevation that would be facing uh, towards the east or towards the um, uh, residential area uh, beyond the, the senior apartment so a little ways away uh, and shows you where the uh, pool would be the entrance on the other side of the building over here uh, but then essentially it would be a, th a three-story building with a hip roof design uh, that's intended to mimic more of a residential type building versus a commercial building that might have a flat roof or some other uh, details that aren't, aren't uh, quite as, as uh, residential in nature. Um, just to kind of highlight the, uh, this is the opposite side then, the west, uh, facing west uh, towards the railroad tracks. This is where the main entrance would be. So you'd have a, a overhang here in the main entrance of the hotel and then this part of the, the property. Um, the hotel materials that, that are proposed would be a mix of, of natural stone for the lower portion of the building uh, with some vertical lap siding on the uh, kind of gable ends of these, these uh, buildings right here. Um, and then a third material, which would be um, um, a proposed metal uh, type uh, vertical panel as well. Uh, that is one of the, the comments that staff has about the building materials. The city code does require 50% of the natural brick and stone, where this is, is much less than that, probably in more in the range of 10 to 15%. Um, with the previous hotel proposal and other similar projects like this, the city has granted some flexibility from that standard with the idea that, um, again, this is more of a, a residential type feel for the building versus a just strictly a commercial type project. Uh, the building that's proposed is somewhat different than the typical one story um, strip mall or other retail development that you might see um, on a site like this. Uh, so I think staff does believe there's some, um, some rationale for granting some flexibility from that standard. However, as you'll see in the report, staff is recommending a minimum of at least 25% of the natural brick and stone with the remainder of the, of the building um, with those additional materials. Uh, and that's again, consistent with some of the uh, previous approvals uh, for buildings of this type. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on the hotel. Otherwise the hotel for the most part, you know, conforms to the city's requirements. There's, there's um, you know, massing is, is broken up to the use of the gable ends. There's different undulations in the building uh, so that it does provide a nice variety and, and the applicant has worked towards meet, meeting our requirements for breaking up the building and, and, and reducing the monotony of having one long um, unbroken structure. So moving on to the senior apartments. Um, so as, as we said, there's uh, proposals for six uh, senior buildings that would house either 20 or 21 units in them, depending on the uh, use of commercial on, on the ground level. Uh, so we have hey, several Kyle. different elevations uh, showing the building. I'm sorry, was there a question? Kyle, I just wanted to, before we jump on to the apartments, um, or maybe you're gonna do this at a later time, I didn't know if it made sense to talk about the, the zoning variances in terms of if the hotel required any setbacks or any height variances at this time, or did you want to do that later with all of them? I just thought since we we're looking at elevations, it might make sense. Yeah, I was going to highlight those later in the report. Okay. Um, of our highlights. I can just briefly mention here because it's, it's, I think there's just really two main exceptions that are being requested to the, the city zoning standards. Uh, so I mentioned the 25, you know, 25 percent brick, brick natural stone, which would be an exception and, and approved separately. But then the, the hotel itself um, ultimately is 40 feet in high, um, which is measured from the, the ground level up to the midpoint of, of this roof. Uh, so it's a little higher than what your typical three-story may be, partly because um, the applicant's trying to accommodate a pool and lobby and other uh, facilities in that ground level. There's a business center in, in the second level. So uh, that necessitates a little higher building than what a typical structure may be. Uh, the city zoning regulations require a 35 foot um, height limit. So this would be um, five feet above the city's base um, and, and uh, minimum required, I'm sorry, maximum required height for uh, this commercial district. Um, with other proposals on, on this property in particular and, and throughout the city, uh, we have seen a similar request for additional height for a hotel like this. Uh, so I know those have been granted in some cases or discussed and, and this is consistent with that. So other than that, the only other exceptions or um, provisions that are request, other exceptions to the code that are requested with this uh, relate to the sharing of parking and the use of one common uh, open space between this and, and the neighboring residential properties. So that's the hotel and we can certainly come back to this if, if you'd like. Uh, so then moving on to the senior buildings and senior apartments, as I said, there are six of these that are being proposed. Uh, they're all, you know, they're being shown as essentially the same buildings with some minor changes based on the, the uh, provision of retail on the ground level for each one. 
Uh, so I'd like to just kind of highlight the, what you're seeing here um, between these side elevations. So the elevations you see here are the views looking north and south. Um, and depending on where the building is in relation to the driveway and streets and so forth, uh, this um, elevation is either overlooking the common open space between two of the buildings or is overlooking and, and fronting onto one of the private driveways serving the project, or in the case of the Northern buildings looking north um, outside the project boundaries. Uh, so the, the elevation here um, for the most part is, is the elevation that's facing um, you know, away from the common open space or facing towards the streets. Uh, the buildings are set up so they're essentially four stories in height uh, or with four stories, including that ground floor uh, parking, uh, two and three levels above that, and then a fourth level. Uh, which would have access to uh, a roof deck and um, some common areas up on top of that, that upper floor. You don't really see that with the bottom drawing down here because it's shielded um, from the, uh, that opposite side. Uh, the roof design would be have incorporate some gables and would be a, a pitched roof. Uh, so a building design that's intended again to follow more of a residential type standard uh, than a flat roof or other uh, type of structure that would be more commercial uh, in nature. Uh, the buildings propose the use of, of different types of, of natural stone or veneer on the side of the building uh, with some uh, cement board uh, fiber shake siding, in addition to some lap siding uh, um, within the structure itself as well. Uh, looking at that, uh, the elevation is facing towards the park area. You can see here, this is where we'd have, uh, you know, the main entrance into the structure or into the facility. Uh, shows you these, these three levels. And then what you're seeing is this upper deck, upper portion, which would be a roof deck, kind of common open space areas, and behind that would be then those additional living units. Uh, so you're really seeing on the fourth floor those upper units behind uh, that deck structure uh, with a roof line extending above that over those, those apartments. Um, and it's probably as, as good a point as any to show or illustrate the height. Um, the height of these buildings is proposed at you know just under 54 feet. And this is uh, at, you know con contrasted with the city's zoning requirements for an R4 district. Uh, which would be 34 feet in height. So this is uh, you know, just shy of 19 feet higher than what the city's minimum standards require for this particular zoning district. And as you can see from these and, and some of the later plans, a lot of that height is really wrapped up into that roof line extending above the fourth level. And then those apartments that are up on that, that fourth level. So if you were to you know, roughly draw a line uh, parallel with our, or you know, indicating our 35 foot height requirement, it would essentially be at this, this roof line up here above that third floor level. Then moving on and, and maybe hopefully illustrating a little more what you're looking at from the side of the building, you know, the two and actually all three of these drawings are showing what you're seeing from the side view of the building. Um, so the one would be looking to the, oops, I'm sorry, one would be looking towards the west and one would be looking towards the east, depending on the orientation and, and uh, where the building's located. Uh, so for those properties that, that are adjacent to this over to the east, the single family residential area, this is the elevation that you would be looking at. Uh, so again, looking at you know ground level with parking on the ground level and either commercial um, or uh, residential depending on the building, two and three levels of uh, apartments, a fourth level of apartment up here, and then the roof deck, which would include a, a covered area, a uh, little portico, but then basically a deck overlooking uh, common areas, which would be over on this portion of the site. Uh, so converse to that view then would be the view that faces towards the streets and would have access to the building. Uh, so you would have your garage entrance into the building here on the ground level, providing access into the parking, again, on that, that main level, your second and third levels and that fourth level with those apartments in the fourth level and then the roof deck over here. Uh, so what you're seeing with these views is that the applicant's proposing a building that, although it does extend well above the city's minimum height requirements, it only extends above that minimum requirements for roughly half of the overall building elevation. Uh, so the half over here is the portion that then extends up Whereas the other portion, you know, is, is at or just slightly above the city's base requirements. Um, the other thing to note with, with the roof design, and you'll see that with, I think the floor plans maybe a little more clearly, is that the deck itself is set back from the building. So that the, the structures where you have the, the stairwells, the elevator shaft, uh, some other things, those are set back away from this roof line. Uh, so you're not seeing those directly up uh, adjacent to uh, that facade or that wall. Uh, there will be some separation there. Likewise, with the deck, you're getting some separation and set back to the higher portion of the building. You obviously do not have that uh, from the side for the elevation that's facing, you know, again, towards the east or towards the west, uh, where you will see that, that fourth floor with the gabled end as well. So just to clarify too, in terms of measuring the height, 
Uh, the city measures the height of a, of a, a gable roof like this by looking at the mid, midpoint between the, the top of the roof and the gutter line, roughly. So it's halfway up here. So that halfway point up here is where the city would measure the height from or where you get your, your height measurement. And that takes into account that, you know, some of this is below the height, some of it is, is above it. So it essentially averages that out. So this is the point where you'd have your, your 50, uh, roughly 54 foot height elevation uh, above the ground level. It's also worth pointing out that this site is, is relatively flat. So you're not seeing a lot of changes in elevation and, and grade where in some other sites in the community where, we, where there are, are larger or um, higher uh, single family, I'm sorry, higher multifamily residential structures, uh, you sometimes will see the garage get tucked into the hillside. Uh, there certainly are times where you'll see the garage and parking underneath the structure, which also helps with um, minimizing the height of those, in those situations. So I think, as I said early on in the presentation, um, the applicant is proposing, partly proposing these higher buildings, uh, partly to accommodate the uh, ground level parking, where it's not possible in this situation to provide that parking underneath and then get additional space that way. So you can kind of see really what that's doing is it's shifting that whole building up to account for that parking area. So that's where you're seeing the additional height, uh, not necessarily above the, the other portion of the building. And then finally, you have just kind of a side view showing how the, the interior framing works, showing parking down below, uh, with departments above and then this this area um i'm sorry the, the apartments then the the common area or deck area over to the uh um, side of the building um just i think two other final comments here one please note that the um you know the parking does extend out beyond the building a little bit so you see this bump out here uh so there's something that's a little unique where there is a little more space in that ground level partially to accommodate the parking uh, but those, that does provide an area for decks and some overhangs for the, the residents that have units in those structures. Then each of the units does have a balcony that overhangs on the side. So these balconies will overhang on the north and south sides of the building, not on the east and west sides of the building. And as you'll see some from the floor plans, I know it's been something that people have asked a lot about. You know, all the, the windows over here are windows that are associated with bedrooms, not the common living space areas within each of the structures. Uh, so there's a little more, um, a uh, little less, I guess, in terms of activities that should be taking place there. Uh, plus, what, what's a little hard to tell here, too, is that you're not, it looks like there's several apartments, but really this only represents um, maybe four or five, six apartments that are actually facing that direction. So then we have a series of floor plans showing that I'd, I'd like to just go through this quickly. So there's um, hopefully an understanding as to how each building is set up and, and what that looks like from a, a, a floor plan perspective. Uh, so this is our, our the floor plan for each of the buildings, uh, showing again that entrance coming off of the private driveways. Uh, the ground level floor plan includes uh, roughly 20 parking spaces, which is the area shown here. Uh, you have the stairwells going up, providing access to the rest of the structure. And then on the, you know, either south or north side of those buildings, uh, there's space for commercial uh, in here. And this is about an 1800 square foot space for commercial development uh, for those buildings that have the mix of uses. And then just some shared common space within each building for lobby, office area, the elevators is located here and in addition to some storage and a vestibule. Now, the only difference between this and then the um, buildings that have the additional apartment would be this space here would be uh, converted and would be used for apartments. And I don't think this plan really shows it real clearly. I think some of the site plans do show that the applicant at one point had been proposing to have a separate garage, basically tuck under garage that would provide access to the ground floor apartment here separate from the rest of the parking area. Uh, as you'll see in the staff report, staff is not supportive of that being part of the application. We feel that just adds some confusion to, you know, where the actual parking uh, space is within each structure and then further uh, provides a side elevation that is, uh, you know, impeded and interrupted by this separate garage space. So keep that in mind that that is something and part of the recommendation that staff has moving forward. And so we'd certainly expect that as these, these plans move forward that that would be addressed by the applicant. So that's the ground level. Then moving up to second and third levels, there really isn't a lot of variation here. This is just showing you the way the units are arranged. Um, I would want to point out here that each unit is really oriented towards that north or south elevation, uh, facing either towards the open space or north towards the, uh, the driveways coming into the site. Uh, so on each end here, you'll see this is where the, the bedrooms are uh, for each of these units, uh, which again, those are the, the, the portions of the structure that faced either to the east or either or to the, the west. Uh, the units themselves are a mixture between, um, you know, two bedroom or three bedroom units. Uh, the three bedroom units sound like a lot, but as you'll see from the, the plans, it really is a, uh, uh, the third bedroom units incorporate uh, um, an area that uh, a smaller apartment that, you know, looks more like a uh, potential office or um, just extra space uh, that can be used by the individuals that are living within the facility. 
so not a lot of variation between the, the second and third level. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time trying to contrast those. Um, the fourth level is here, and this is where you're seeing that breakdown between the half of the building that would be used for the apartments, very similar to the levels below it, in addition to that common space area leading out into the roof deck here. So everything out here is um, at that roof level. Uh, this is all roof. A portion of it um, would, be, would be the deck, kind of common area that's used for the, the applicant res or the residents of the structure. Uh, the rest would be used just as, as roof um, and open um, you know, to, the, to the sky. Uh, on these particular plans. So you see an elevator shaft here, stairwell, hallway, and then connecting into this uh, kind of common space uh, room area. Then the last plan uh, shows you the, ultimately the roof plan for the property. Uh, so again, this is showing you the, the gabled ends of the roof that would be facing uh, towards the uh, uh, east and west, uh, the area that'd be left open, that would be roof, and then the, the deck area leading into the common space uh, on that upper level. So as I was trying to explain, looking at those side elevations, you know, as you're looking from the east, you're looking from the west, uh, what you're seeing is, is building here. And this is the portion of the building that does go up to the full uh, 54 feet in height. But then uh, the roof here, uh, which would be level with about that 35 foot elevation, which would lead back then to these other improvements centralized to the, the structure, including the, uh, this common space deck, and then the, this portico, or whatever else that would be building um, at that, that top level. And then before pausing for some additional questions, I, you know, one of the things the applicant did provide as well was, was kind of a cross section showing, you know, where the road would be in relation to these structures and what the height difference may look like compared to the single family residential homes uh, further to the east. So this is roughly to scale showing business parkway and the center line of business parkway right here. And then what those respective distances and elevations would be for the, the properties here. So we're not one stress, this isn't looking at a specific property or a, a specific home. This is a typical kind of single family home height uh, shown here uh, across the way. Uh, it does not look like they're using a two story home. Um, and then showing that in kind of a comparison to what you're seeing on the other side. So this is showing you again, that full height up to that uh, roof line for that, that fourth level uh, looking north and south uh, from Business Parkway. So I know it's a lot of detail uh, and information to digest, so I'd like to maybe pause again before I move on to some of the, the staff comments and, and uh, staff recommendation for this application. Yes, question? Brenda. Yep, go ahead, Brenda. Um, Kyle, can you write, remind me once again the reason why they're not, um, I guess, having the underground parking? I mean, they have the space for it, obviously, because they have the above ground parking but why they aren't having underground parking. Yeah, and I'm, I'm probably gonna want the applicant to address that more specifically since they're the ones that have been working on the site and, and kind of know what they're uh, proposing to do here. I think it comes down to a matter of the scale of the building uh, and having a building that has fewer units and being able to accommodate that parking just doesn't work in terms of the area that you need. Uh, typically to do underground parking, you're gonna need a, a much larger building in order to get the, the space and the area and separation you need to provide that parking below the, the grade. Um, so I think that that's a part of it. And then secondly, you know, the buildings, as I said, were something that, uh, you know, the applicant feels is, is a unique product and, and would be unique to the site uh, versus a larger structure. And so with that, there's some limitations as to how you can do underground parking. And then finally, um, you know, looking at the setbacks and, and where the buildings are situated, you know, with, with each of these buildings, they're, sit, they're set up really close to the street uh, without a lot of separation there. So in order to get that, the parking into the building, you need to have room to provide a, an adequately sloped ramp uh, with space to get down into the building uh, without impacting or impeding, you know, your ability to do parking inside the structure. So I think you're right with, with the size of the site, uh, you might be able to accommodate um, some additional um, parking there or in-ground parking, but you'd end up having the buildings much further apart and then you'd lose a lot of the open space and then trying to do that. So I think it does become more of an economic question as to, you know, at what scale is it appropriate and, uh, uh, maybe economically feasible to do underground parking. Right. Okay. I'll ask the applicant because I was thinking, you know, 19 feet is quite a, a big jump from what we're allowing our normal standard of 34 feet. And that's probably because of the parking or the garages. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, Brent, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick question. I know that the Eastern elevation doesn't have balconies, but the most Eastern apartment on the North South has a balcony and the neighbor's concerns of privacy from the, the height of the building. Do those balconies have a, a privacy wall that so that 
they can't see over into the neighboring properties or is that just an open rail or is that to be determined yet? That may be another question for the applicant. I, I think what they're showing doesn't indicate that there's any screening going on between those, but that's really a detail of the building that probably wouldn't necessarily show up in, in a drawing like this. So again, definitely worth asking the applicant that question um, in terms of how they plan to manage those. Yeah, on that on that same note, Brent, I had kind of the, a similar thought um, of if those, I think your privacy wall idea is much greater than, much better than my thought. My thought was, is there a way to push those balconies back or more in inward? So to push them, push those balconies that are on the end um, as far to the west of that, those end apartments as possible too, to to give more separation from the landscape or from the neighbors to the east. Um, Kyle, can you go back to the kind of I think I don't know what plan it was, but it was with the rooftop just recently. That yep. So I think it was hard to see from the elevations and and such like does the rooftop deck are people going to be able to be in that roof and overlooking to the to the residents to the east well, or do they come up and the they're I, the way I see the the plans that are in front of us and then again if the applicant I think has, has a different idea or maybe is thinking differently he can tell you but right now that the deck of the roof is kind of limited to this area right here okay and so presumably there'd be some barriers or something that prevent people from going further to the um, east or west. And just to remind you again, this is the portion of the building that's facing towards that common open space right, area. Right. Uh, so that there would be a separation from that deck line to that that uh, farthest uh, um, eastern and western property line. Okay. So okay. this is kind of off limits. It, it certainly is available for maintenance purposes, but this would be just a flat roof and open to the sky above. Whereas you know here you'd have a deck they're showing a portico and some other improvements associated with that deck, but that would be set back and set back from the structure. And if I um, had better eyes, I might be able to see that distance on the, the plan here, but um, I can look that up too if we need to know kind of what that distance is. Okay, I, I was just curious as to, it was hard to see from some of the elevations of where the doors came out and such yeah. on how that was. Are there any other comments or questions from the commission right now? You know, one Kyle, quick question. I, yes, is there Michael. something in particular here that makes us senior apartments, Kyle, other than just apartments? Uh, the applicant has indicated that these will be age-restricted um, housing units. I, I can't remember the top of my head what that restriction is. I believe it's plus 50 or more. And so to um, build apartments in that manner, they have to commit to having you know each apartment um, with a restriction on, on the age, uh, age for the people living in these facilities. Where does that restriction come in? Uh, again, I would probably ask the applicant to address that, um, okay. how, how he's planning on managing and running the apartments. All right. Any other questions for staff at this time before we let Kyle continue? Okay, Kyle. Okay. Keep going. So then the next kind of section of the report or the presentation just looks at our staff review comments. And I think we've hit on some of these before, so I won't spend a lot of time on these. Uh, but in terms of staff review, so the, in terms of land use and zoning, uh, I want to stress the 2.3 acres under the application would remain commercial. That would be the portion of the hotel or the hotel site. Uh, so that's not changing. It's just really the PUD you're approving for that for the hotel if this were to move forward. The housing side of things, um, the ultimate density that's being proposed here over the entire area would be 22 and a half units per acre, uh, which falls well within the range of, of high density housing, which is 12 to 40 units per acre in the city. Uh, so it's definitely, you know, achieves that, that, that higher density housing and falls within the high density housing category, uh, but again, as well within the density requirements the city's established. Uh, the building design, we talked about the PUD exceptions um, that would be requested, one for the hotel to allow up to 25% brick and stone as opposed to 50% brick and stone on the building. Uh, I'm not sure if we talked about it with the uh, senior apartments, but the senior um, apartments would be a mixture of the uh, lap siding, um, the architectural kind of um, uh, shingles, and then the, the stone uh, kind of veneer on, on the property. And with other similar projects like this, uh, where we've had residential or high density residential, there isn't a specific requirement for certain types of materials. 
the city has asked that, you know, no more than a certain percentage of the building be the lap siding uh, to be a higher quality material uh, used throughout the facility. So uh, staff is recommending um, that there be at least 60% or a minimum of six, a maximum 60% lap siding uh, used in the senior apartments. And then the 40% would have to be the higher quality materials, brick stone and so forth. Uh, so those are the recommendations in terms of building design. Those would be exceptions that are spelled out or conditions that are spelled out in, in the approvals. Uh, the building height uh, is certainly something that we expect um, we'll have more questions on and we know some of the public has, has expressed concern about this. Uh, the hotel has proposed 40 feet. Uh, this is very consistent with other commercial uh, approvals the city has granted, you know, four other hotels in the past. Uh, the five foot PUD exception seems reasonable given the, what the applicant's doing on the property. So that's one aspect of the, the PUD that, that would be an exception. But then uh, secondly, and, and maybe more critically, uh, the applicant is requesting senior apartments be allowed to go up to 53 and three quarters feet height. I think we, we round off in the, the, in the recommendation to 54 feet. That's roughly a 19 foot exception above the, the base zoning requirements. Um, and again, I'm hopefully applicant is able to shed a little more light on some of their rationale and thinking behind the senior apartments and why, why they've been designed that way and, and what, uh, why they feel that's the exception is, is um, you know, not only, um, you know, acceptable in this situation, but also helps promote a higher quality development. For other site plan comments in terms of building setbacks, uh, the site meets or exceeds all of the city's zoning standards for setbacks for both the commercial and, and residential buildings. Uh, there is common open space between those structures. So it's a little different type of analysis, whereas typically we're measuring two property lines, whereas here, all of the properties are essentially part of one larger development through the PUD process. Uh, looking at you know, those external setbacks, though, uh, the buildings are able to comply with all external setbacks to um, adjacent property lines uh, for the district in which the, they're located. We didn't talk, we talked a little bit about parking and how the parking is being arranged on the site, but the applicant in doing their analysis did look at each individual use separately, uh, determined that the city would require 351 parking stalls through our zoning standards, and that's looking at the site as a whole, the hotel and the six apartment buildings. Uh, they've shown a plan that provides 383 stalls. So they're, you know, in excess of, of the city's minimum parking standards by 32 stalls. So there should be a surplus of parking overall based on the city's parking standards. And of those stalls, 122 would be interior within each individual building. Uh, 261 stalls would be surface parking uh, available for use throughout the, the uh, hotel and the apartment site. Uh, from landscaping, we went through these numbers um, in terms of the, the applicant being short of the overstory tree re requirement. Uh, there is a need to recalculate out those uh, interior parking lot landscaping to ensure that those minimum standards are being met. And then we talked about you know adding or having a requirement that the northernmost parking area needs to have a screen of at least 90% opacity uh, from the residential zoning district. And with the additional trees that are required as part of the planting, uh, we can certainly talk about the, the appropriate location for those trees and what may provide the best screen uh, should the application move forward. And I don't think I have a lot of comments about sidewalks and trails. There is a, a, a fairly robust system of trails and uh, walkways adjacent to individual buildings with, within the project area. And it also ties in nicely with the adjacent um, sidewalks and trails along Business Parkway um, and other uh, streets within the uh, area further to the east. Uh, so we don't see any major issues with providing good connections and access into another project area. So although it still is uh, predominantly an, uh, you know, a, a, a automobile oriented type development uh, that provides parking for autos and so forth, uh, it, there should be opportunities for folks that want to walk and, and move between the buildings there um, within the structure. And so there's good access to do that. Um, other issues I mentioned briefly of the, the fact that the city did ask our uh, transportation consultant to put together a traffic study, uh, really focusing on a comparison of the proposed plan to so the plan in front of the planning commission tonight with other previous plans that have been submitted for commercial development of the site. And so in order to do this analysis, staff did ask the, the applicant to uh, take a look at the, um, the site as a whole, including both the um, area that's subject to the PUD tonight and then the overall concept plan that the applicant's been working towards uh, for the site as a whole. Uh, and then looking at those two and, and, and seeing how those compare. So ultimately in looking through the, the, the traffic study, what you'll see is that by moving to this plan that has some additional housing components versus residential uh, and has housing that's senior in nature versus a, a general occupancy type uh, situation, that there is a reduction um, in the expected traffic from those previous concept plans which included a big box retailer, uh, some retail and apart or uh, restaurant uses, 
uh, over what the overall concept would be that includes these uh, specific components that are considered tonight. Uh, and we, those are further broken down by a 10% reduction in AM PM peak uh, periods or traffic conditions, uh, and then a 7.5% reduction in those, those weekday trips. Um, so not a, a significant difference between the different uses, but, but hopefully helps illustrate that uh, the plan that's coming forward tonight certainly won't have impacts above and beyond uh, from a traffic perspective, the previous concept plans for commercial development that have either been approved or considered by the city for the site, uh, but also you know, seem to fit in fairly well with, with the um, uh, road system that's been installed and in place uh, for serving this and the surrounding areas. We talked about the staff recommendation concerning the three quarters intersection. Um, in terms of the traffic study, there really wasn't a lot of analysis that went into their comments regarding that three quarters intersection. So I don't think staff is overly concerned that maybe some of the comments they had referenced a um, right in right out situation versus you know left turn movement abilities turn in there. Um, but we think this is a one potential way to help um, address some concerns about how much traffic might be coming, especially from that northern area and then turning north into the residential subdivision, uh, where uh, the idea here is that it, it would be much more easy and uh, make it more efficient to continue turning onto Business Parkway uh, to go south either on 149th or back to 42, again, versus coming through the residential area. And then finally, I think staff is noting that um, as that Western area develops, uh, we would certainly recommend that the city consider a further traffic study uh, when that area develops to investigate um, you know, what's happening, uh, should this project move forward and how the traffic is flowing, and then how to incorporate that additional traffic from the, those sites that are further to the West, whether they're commercial or higher density housing in nature. Um, Okay, so moving on to some general comments here. Uh, in terms of the meeting, uh, we did receive, or the city received three letters or emails in advance of the meeting uh, with comments about the proposal. Uh, those are from the individuals that you see listed here. Um, so we wanna make sure that we recognize that we do have those letters. Uh, two of those letters were in your packet. The third was emailed out prior to the meeting since we got that after the packet uh, was, was mailed out. Uh, just to quickly summarize, I think the, the three letters for the most part uh, all raise questions or concerns about uh, development in terms of the traffic, uh, one, and the impacts to the residential area adjacent to this project. And then secondly, concerned about the height of the buildings and what that means for uh, privacy of single family homes and the backyards next to the site. And um, the fact that that's a fairly substantially different from the city's base zoning requirements uh, for a high density residential use. So with that, uh, the staff recommendation um, in your packet is, is for approval of all the components of this request, which include the things listed here, uh, which includes a comprehensive plan amendment with one condition, and that condition being that the uh, Met Council approve the, the uh, uh, amendment, which is a requirement uh, for all comp plan amendments in the community, uh, a zoning map amendment with one condition, which would relate back to the comp plan amendment uh, to make sure that uh, if the comp plan amendment isn't approved, that the zoning can't be approved. Uh, PUD master development plan, which would have 12 conditions of approval. I will not go through those individually because I think we've hit on those conditions and requirements uh, as we've talked about this and those are in the staff report. Uh, PUD final development plan with one condition, that condition relates back to the fact that um, the applicant would need to follow all the PUD master plan requirements. And then finally the plat for Rosewood Commons, um, which would be uh, a recommendation a recommendation for two conditions of approval there uh, that the applicant comply with the city engineer standards and that they also uh, provide all easements that, that are requested by the city. Now, given that um, some of the information has been submitted uh, shortly before the meeting and um, so, you know, staff hasn't had a lot of time to look through those things and the fact that there's some additional um, drawings that would need to be updated to reflect those updated drawings, staff is also suggesting there's an alternate recommendation that would, um, where the planning commission could continue this request uh, to provide the applicant with additional time to, you know, one, further update the landscape plan to accommodate all the required plantings and to address any comments or questions from the planning commission uh, during the course of the meeting. Uh, to revise all their development drawings, again, to bring those up to speed with the most recent drawings for the hotel and some of those common areas. Uh, to provide additional information regarding the visual impacts. Um, I know as we've, we've talked to individuals about this, there's been some question about, you know, how, how really will this fit in with the surrounding neighborhood? What will you be seeing? Um, how much of the you know, building might be visible from these single family homes? Those sorts of questions. So that is, is another area that might may warrant additional information on the part of the applicant. And then finally to address any other planning question concerns that may come out during the course of our hearing tonight or other concerns you may have about the, the project moving forward. So again, we wanted to make sure given the, you know, the, the number of, of uh, uh, plans that are submitted and the numerous pieces of information that go with this request that uh, as an alternate 
you, the planning commission can certainly uh, consider a, a request or consider um, continuing this item to give uh, both staff, the applicant and the planning commission more time to work through some of those issues. So with that, um, I know I haven't talked continuously, but um, I've talked a lot here. So with that, I'm certainly able to answer questions and uh, I'll, I'll go further reiterate that the applicant is um, waiting you know, in, in the wings here uh, to address the, the commission, address any questions you may have as well. Sounds good. Thanks, Kyle, for the um, presentation this evening. Are there comments, questions from the commission at this time? In addition to what's already been, we've already asked along the way. Yes, Commissioner Brent. Yeah, I just have one question. The Northwest corner, part of this approval is to, to allow um, the high density housing in that, in that portion as well. I guess, is it or no? It is off, not. off to the left up there by the pond. I thought that there was a, a plan that called for an apartment building there as well. Yeah, it looks like I, I had a, um, the, your packet includes a concept plan and I meant to have that in the, the list of attachments here that, that we were going through. But the applicant provided a, um, as, as part of our discussions about this site and how it fits in with the surrounding properties did provide an overall concept plan that would call for further expansion of the high density housing further west of the site. So over here on this portion of the site. Right. Um, and then would uh, keep this area down here commercial. And so they, they have a plan for a kind of larger retailer at the far Western end, along with a kind of small strip commercial area with some restaurant space as well uh, within this area north of highway 42. So they it's worth referencing that, that that plan is not part of the approval tonight. You're not being asked to take okay. action on that. That's okay. in your packet for illustration purposes only uh, and to help kind of understand maybe how this fits in with the surrounding property. Uh, so what that means is if the applicant did want to pursue the senior apartments that are shown on that concept plan, there would be a further comp plan change rezoning for that area west of the apartments and hotel here. So that would be a separate action needed at some point in the future, presumably. So you're really only, you're only being asked to take action on what you're seeing here in front of you, which would be the senior apartments, hotel, and for that property only. All right, thank you. Any other comments or questions from the commissioners? Okay, I had just a couple, um, Kyle, for you. On the, you mentioned um, when you were talking about the traffic and the traffic study that there is a, I don't know if it was a condition to do a traffic study when the Western development um, proposal comes forward or that it um, is a recommendation, but ultimately what what would change with that? You know, what kind of things will that traffic study tell us and what kind of changes would be implemented if the traffic is found to be um, at what levels, I guess? What is, what's the purpose of that traffic study, I guess, is the root of my question. I think it would, the intent would be to help um, with some decisions about improvements necessary to provide service to those that Western portion of the property. Um, presumably at that time, there would be some development that would take place um, if this is approved for the hotel or senior apartments. And so there'd at least be a chance for the city to look at any updated numbers for traffic counts in the area, um, have a more specific look at, at the, the buildings that are actually built on the property um, and also weigh you know, kind of some of the, the existing conditions based on, again, development that happens or anything else that may change in, in the area in the future. So I think it was really more intended to be, you know, another chance for the city to uh, look at the uh, traffic in this area and to make sure that whatever happens further to the west is consistent with the overall uh, flow of traffic and improvements in, 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 the, in the area. Okay. Um, and then the, um, you mentioned that it's a, you know, roughly 10% reduction from the, what the commercial was, um, but I assume it's it's quite an overall increase from the initial development layout when it was more of a residential, low medium density residential forecasted on that property, correct? Uh, presumably that would be correct just because uh, um, single family homes and then the type of homes you could have on this much land would be less than what a commercial or, or high density housing development would be. Okay. Um, and then I guess um, my other questions and I will share um, with the commission and those, on, I, I do live in this neighborhood and I am a um, property that is close to this development. So um, I will probably have a lot of comments and questions as we go through it this evening. Um, the, the north access there, 
you know, I get that putting it there puts it in the middle of kind of four buildings on one side of it and two buildings in the hotel on the other side of it. But, you know, thoughts to aligning it with Brenner, if there has to be a second access, which um, I think, you know, initially the access was 149th through here um, long ago when it was going to be, maybe Brenner Court even when it was residential. But thoughts of aligning that with Brenner Court versus it moving that closer into the, the neighborhood there and aligning it with a road that's already existing in there? So your question is if, if staff had considered that or uh, had weighed that? Yeah, I mean, I, I get that it would cut up that green, that big green space, but you, you know, you could have some green space on the other side where the access was coming in or, or something there. Um, I mean, that staff did talk to the applicant about some options for maybe where to provide access. I think the applicant expressed some concern about having it cut through that, that green space area and that would reduce the overall amount of green space that could be provided. Um, and on top of that, I, I don't think, uh, you know, that road itself is fairly close to uh, the Southern Access Drive. Um, so I'm, I, I think we were unsure as to how much benefit you would get by having that road in that location versus having it a little further to the north. Um, this access, I think, is seen as really serving mostly those, those residential homes. Uh, so although there could be some, res, you know, hotel traffic coming out here, uh, again, the expectation is that the majority of that traffic is going to be wanting to go down to Highway 42, um, not necessarily going up further north in the community uh, or heading elsewhere further to the east here. Yeah, I think it's, I think visually, you know, aligning it with, and I think in a lot of places, we try and align roads with roads that already exist. Um, adding an access that out of the blue that wasn't, wasn't there before and aligning it to two neighbors' backyards um, is obviously not very visually appealing and is kind of even more encroaching on privacy of, of those as well, um, I think from that placement. So I think that's kind of where my, my comments stem from is I think the location of it is, you know, is even more visually, you know, visually from a privacy aspect and such versus aligning it to an existing road that's there. Okay. I think that is all my additional questions at this time. Are there any other questions from commissioners before we open the public hearing tonight? Okay, at this time um, we will open the public hearing and I will just review how you can participate this evening if you would like to speak. We did have a handful of questions come in during Kyle's presentation this evening um, and I did acknowledge, I believe all of them or close to all of them, um, and encourage you to speak during this time um, and ask your questions. And if you are unable, um, we will ask the questions um, at the end of the public hearing as well. So you can feel free to, to ask it or if you are unable, we will go ahead and do so. So just a reminder, if you're participating online, you can use the raise your hand feature. Um, sorry, let me jump. Back forward, um, backwards a little bit. When you're speaking, please start by stay, say, stating your name and address for the record. We wanna give everyone that wants an opportunity to speak tonight um, the opportunity to do so. We ask that each person speak only once, um, so please have your comments prepared and ready. And we will address questions um, as they are raised immediately after you're done speaking. And if you'd like to respond or answer any follow-up questions, you may do so at that time as well. To speak on this item, if you're using the Zoom web applica application, you can click on the words raise hand on the application and you will be called on when, when it's your turn. At that time, you will be able to unmute your microphone and speak. Please be sure to mute your microphone again after you're done speaking. And if you have called in on the phone, I'm not sure if we have any phone callers, but if you have called in on the phone, um, you can press star zero, st sorry, star six um, and you can speak that way as well. Um, and um, as I've done in previous public hearings via Zoom, I will just quickly, we did receive, as Kyle said, um, three comments that were emailed in. Um, and so um, I'm not gonna really review them much because Kyle already did, but we had Mike and Genesee Rasmussen um, talking about safety, loss of privacy, um, increased traffic coming into the neighborhood, the blind curve at 148th Street and Business Parkway, um, a lot of loss of privacy um, in terms of you know this versus if it was 
um, some commercial that um, the residential is more permanent. Um, they did ask a series of questions here um, as well. And so I will try and monitor if those questions are asked tonight and answered, or I will come back and ask them. Um, we also received a um, letter from Jean and Mike Brown um, commenting on the entrance and exit um, at the north, the north access um, being very undesirable. Um, and then questions around the landscaping and what is included in green space. So maybe the applicant can address that um, in terms of the green space. Um, the other question that's kind of for the applicant, I'm gonna jump back to Mike and Genesee Rasmussen here. Another question that came in for the applicant is um, maybe looking at two stories um, to protect the privacy of residents um, and what options um, can be done to present the to prevent the privacy or can be explored to ensure privacy for residents, sorry. Um, and then the third um, letter was from Shelly Passery commenting on high traffic level, height of the buildings and privacy. So some of the same concerns that we have heard, um, you know, what can be done um, to prevent, you know, all these occupants from seeing into the private yards, um, what buffering and landscaping will be done. Um, and um, she did close with, you know, thinking that with, with planning, a logical and safe plan can be made so that all are happy. Um, and then also a comment on construction trucks um, through the neighborhood. So with that, I will open up um, the public hearing this evening and I will invite our applicant is on the phone with us this evening. And so I will first um, allow him the opportunity to speak and then we will get to the other public, but there've been a handful of questions and comments for the applicant. So we'll give him time at the beginning of the public hearing to kick it off. Warren, go ahead if you'd like to speak. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to share some, some comments here. Um, a, a couple of issues, the concerns I just want to talk about. Uh, one uh, thought just occurred to me on that access to the north. I'm a civil engineer also, so I kind of understand traffic and streets and that kind of stuff pretty well. And I don't even know if I should throw this out there, but it just occurred to me that, I mean, I don't think it's it's not mandatory that we even have that access. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we could turn that into another parking lot and cut off that access if the city staff feels that that would make sense, but then obviously there would be a lot more traffic on that southern access, but uh, um, I guess the neighbors would probably like that and, um, and, and should be able to be designed for that, I would think. So that's, that's one possibility that would eliminate the concerns there. Um, and the other, I, it seems like the, the other major objection is the height of the buildings and well, underground parking and the height of the buildings kind of go together. Let me talk about the underground parking first. I mean, obviously we looked at that and uh, maximum grade on any street and well, driveways is 10%, but on street would be normally 8%. And with, with that much traffic would probably be what we'd be looking at. And, and to drop a, an underground parking like 10 feet would require 120 foot long driveway. And so obviously we would have to change the orientation of buildings. And so the buildings would then be oriented north and south. So then all the people on the back of the building would be looking at the single family houses. I mean, it could be done a long linear building with actual underground parking, but then you'd have dozens of units overlooking the single family houses to the east. And we just felt that that was not in the best interest of the residents. We wanted to provide a real high quality apartment buildings. Um, and that's one of the reasons we made them age restricted to 55 plus. Um, so you're not gonna have a lot of kids. Um, you're not gonna have teenagers tearing through there. So it should be a fairly quiet neighbors. Um, and then, and um, I mean, uh, to do six buildings, 20 buildings is 
obviously not the most efficient way of doing it. We felt it'd be the best, the most pleasing way of doing it to give more of a residential feel to the neighborhood to have smaller buildings and 20 units each more, uh, more or less. Uh, otherwise, I mean, it's obviously a lot more efficient to do it all in one building. Now we have six elevators instead of one, for instance. And, uh, but they're gonna be very nice high-end units. Um, we wanted to have a really attractive buildings. Uh, there's been the comments, so why don't you just do two stories? And we, we looked at that and they could be done. But we felt the, the appearance of having a third story in half the building actually enhances the appearance of it. We could have flat roofs, which would make it a lot less high, but then you have more of a industrial commercial feel, which is popular in some areas. But again, we wanted to have it more of a residential feel. And that's why we have the pretty high, tall roof lines, which give it a more residential and higher end appearance. And we're only having one apartment in that fourth level that overlooks the residential area on the east side. Uh, somebody made the comment about privacy wall on the decks, and that's probably, that's a good idea. We actually hadn't gotten that far. And I think we could certainly uh, incorporate that into the design uh, on all the decks, uh, actually. Um, so I, I would certainly be open to that. Um, I, I guess that's it. Uh, if there are any other concerns I missed or, or if you have any other questions, I'd certainly be able, willing to answer. I guess the landscaping, I, Evidently, we never looked at the code because we're 100 trees short. Yeah, we obviously didn't look at that. But I don't know. I actually don't know where we could put another 100 trees. We could certainly put a bunch more uh, between the, the building on the north end and the uh, single family area. That would accommodate a bunch more trees. But I don't know where we could put another 100 trees. I mean, somebody suggested maybe some of the neighbor's yards. Perhaps. Uh, Answer there is the city says, okay, maybe you only need to do 80% of the requirement or something. And then we could have a private meeting with the uh, residents and put a bunch of trees in their backyard or wherever they want. Um, just throwing out that as an idea. But we certainly want to work with the you guys on, and eliminating your concerns or to whatever extent we can. But we honestly are tr trying to provide a real high quality apartments. Um, as you probably know, we're also developers of the Rosewood Crossing, which is the apartments just north of the tracks there. And that's a market rate one. And that's uh, going real well again now. Um, but this is going to be a more higher end uh, product. And so I don't know, we're, we're excited about it. But uh, I guess I'm just here to answer any other questions. Thanks, Warren. Um, a couple questions for you in regards to some of the apartments. Um, there are some some apartments that are three bedroom, but yeah. in the market rate um, apartments that you just mentioned to the north, I believe those are all one and two bedroom. With this being your being senior living, what is the thought behind a three bedroom apartment well, in this really, complex? We won't be marketing them as three bedrooms. There'll be two bedrooms and a den. Okay. Uh, as you know, most people my age or, or approaching my age are used to being in a bigger home. Um, kids are all gone, and but they like to pretend they can work at home. If they're gonna work, they like having a den. They like their man cave. I do. I like having <laughs> my room where I can go and watch my football games. And uh, so I think a lot of people will want that. Um, and those that we think almost everybody's going to want uh, a place where their kids or grandkids could come and visit them. So almost everybody will at least want the two bedrooms. That's why we're doing minimum of two bedrooms. And the third bedroom is really a den. It's for those that want their man cave or whatever. Okay. Okay. That's the thinking there. And we've got some feedback from brokers and um, that, that say that there's a demand for that. And honestly, to be honest, we've never done this. 
So we don't know. We're just believing what, what we've been told. So we'll know after first building. Actually, just as an aside on Rosewood Crossing, we're finding we're renting the one bedrooms at three to one rate over two bedrooms. So we've got like in the first building, the one bedrooms are all rented and we still have half our two bedrooms left. So we're actually gonna be modifying the third building to uh, reduce number two bedrooms and increase number one bedrooms. So okay. we're hurting the market as we go, I guess. So. Okay. Um and then with that, was there, you know, just back to the height, I think that is um, a big concern of, of the residents that we saw in some of the comments, um, as well as I know myself. Um, is there thoughts, you know, there's four apartments on that top floor. And if you were right. to make the buildings a little bit wider, so, you know, push the, the east wall a little bit, or I'm sorry, the west, the west side a little bit further to the west and, and add an extra, 25, 30 feet um, to each building, would you be, I mean, it seems like you could incorporate those four apartments into the, the two lower floors then. I mean, we any- could. Yep, we could. I mean, it, it makes it a little bit larger, but you know, so it makes it, you know, 30 feet longer maybe, but yeah. um, doesn't add any additional windows to the neighbors, but reduces that height down. That's absolutely a possibility. Um, it would push it a little. It takes some more of the land yeah. to the to the west, honestly, obviously. Honestly, I feel adding that fourth story, and that was my idea. It gives it more character, and with the uh, we have a community building up on top and a roof deck for uh, some of the people as a community area. I I just thought it was a really cool feature, but we don't need that. So yeah, I mean, that's certainly a possibility. Okay. I just, I'm just trying to brainstorm ideas with the, the, yeah. the height restriction is a 50, you know, more than a 50% increase over what the zoning ordinance allows. Yeah. So it's not just a, a few feet. Yeah, and most of that increase is roof. <laughs> that's, it'd probably, it'd be 40 feet with, without the roof. So, I mean, it, because it's a steep pitch roof, which is higher end homes have steep pitches, as you know. Um, that's that's the majority of that additional. Okay, and I, I will say from a um, from being a resident in the neighborhood, I do like the thought of a a roof with a steep versus the flat roof. I I do appreciate yeah, what you've I mean, done there, and I. So, but your idea of extending it and and eliminating those four, I I'm not opposed to that. Yeah, it can be done. Yeah. I don't know if the other commissioners have have thoughts on that too. I'll let them. I'm sure as well. I don't know. I, I don't know if there were other, does the, any of the commissioners have other questions for the applicant? I'll try and jump through and see if I had any others from the right ends. I have a couple. Yes, Brenda, go ahead. Um, I, I think that one of the questions had been asked prior to, we, you know, we do have a limitation of what kind of retail can go in there, but do you have something particularly in mind for your retail? Uh, we don't. Um, I, I, I imagine it's gonna be community type retail like salon or something like that. But I, I don't have any real, you know, I don't really know. Okay. And then um, as far as, so it's 55 plus um, as far as that's how you're marketing the apartments. Yeah. That's what I'm told. And you said they're going to be market value. Well, no, I said the the ones to the north that we're doing is market value. Okay. Uh, so which is are just, these these is restricted. Based on, I'm sorry. Are they based on like income or? No, no, no. no these are just re age restricted. So it's market value as anybody can do it can rent but these it's age restricted so it's not market value right age restricted but is it also based on an age restriction based on as your income as well no no it's not based on income okay. well the, the rents are going to be fairly high because they're going to be high units so 
and they're going to have to qualify. We have to we qualify everybody. And I think, um, as as Melissa said, I that's the first thing I thought of, and I've asked the question too about the the height. Um, I mean, I like your concept. It does look cool to have you know a, an upper deck to hang out on, but um, I think you'll sell it more to the neighbors if uh, we didn't have to deal with 19 extra feet above what's allowed. Anything else, Brenda? Nope, that's it, thank you. Okay, sounds good. Commissioner Schmizek. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mr. Ed, I hope I say your name right, is, is Israelson. Yep. I, I guess I'm impressed right now with, I think the thought process you, processes you have put into this to try and minimize impacts to the residential area and make it attractive to them. Now, I don't live in that area. So, but I, you know, I, I, I struggle with saying to you, widen the building out and shorten it. And then it looks like a flat top retail building near a residential area when you've made an effort to try and hopefully make it fit in. I, I think you have made significant efforts to minimize, or to, I, I should say to, to not impact those neighbors and, and, and have their privacy or take into consideration their privacy concerns with the way you've oriented the buildings. And I think with your willingness to look at some kind of the privacy screening on, on the decks. Um, I, I guess with that, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with trying to put way more restrictions on you. And I, and I think your willingness to say, well, and I don't know what the, I don't know what Kyle and, and others think about, well, if the neighbors don't like that Northern, Northern uh, driveway in, we can eliminate it. I, I think you're making a lot of efforts to do this and, and I think you're open to other considerations. So um, whatever you're doing, I, I don't think I'm going to suggest that you design the building according to me, but I think you're, you know, you can look at it, you can think about it. And I think you're willing to do that in, in order to uh, answer some of the concerns. So I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Any um, other comments from, or not comments, but questions from the commissioners for the applicant? I had one more, sorry. Yes, yes, Brenda. When we, we, when we talk about the hotel, um, are we, do you have anybody, like a particular chain in mind? How would you, would you open that for bid or how does that work? Um, what, what's your question on the hotel? When, in regards to the hotel, I think I read where it hasn't been determined, like which, you know, let's say if it's a chain, a Holiday Inn Express or, you know, whatever oh. kind, is it is it uh, privately named or is it a chain or how do you, you know, decide it, that? It will be a major chain. Um, we haven't decided which one yet. As we get further in the process, I will be meeting with the major chains, which are Hilton and Marriott. Okay. And, and so forth. I will be meeting. We, we just haven't done that yet. Actually, I mean, we're, we're providing a hotel that's nice enough. And again, it's going to be a very, very nice hotel, with nice finishes that we believe any chain would be very interested in putting it in one of their lines. I do like the idea of a hotel. I know it's been uh, tossed around a lot, you know, in recent years for this city of, you know, gosh, who knows what the new, new census says, but it's long overdue to have at least a hotel in this size of town. So thank you. Well, this pandemic has kind of thrown a loop in everybody's plans, so. Uh, we we'll have to wait to see how things pan out before we actually start building the hotel, but that's the plan someday. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, 
there. there. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak on this item this evening? Madam Chair, there were a number of questions asked yes. in the Q&A. Um, I would just ask that if there are an, any attendees um, that did um, uh, submit some questions there uh, to do this uh, at this time, do so verbally uh, for the commission. Thank you, Anthony. I believe someone had their hand up before we went to the applicant, so I'm, but I'm not, I did not see who that was. Madam Chair, just a quick question. Yes. Have we opened the public hearing yet or? Yes, we opened the public hearing before Warren okay. spoke. Yep. Sorry. Sorry, I must've been dozing. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item tonight? Just a reminder to state your name and address for the record when you start. We have one person raising their hand, uh, Andy Dosdall. Um, you can go ahead and unmute your mic, Andy, and uh, make your comment. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Great. Um, Andy Dosdall, my address is uh, 14803 Blanc Avenue. So I live in the, um, the neighborhood that would be by this senior care facilities and hotel. Um, my question is around the hotel. Um, I, I guess it's a two part question. Um, first off, um, what was the researcher? Why, why is a hotel going in here? Why is there a need for a hotel in this particular spot, especially next to a neighborhood? And then my second part is, I think someone else asked this, but knowing that a hotel can bring in a lot of people having wanting to have a good time, is there gonna be any noise restrictions um, being that this is right next to um, you know, a lot of residential area and senior care um, apartment living? We can go ahead and Warren, I'm not sure if you're speaking or if you want to address those questions or staff, you want to take them? Do you want me to address that? Kyle, would you like to address Andy's questions or would you like Warren to? Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll start with um, the question about uh, a hotel. Um, the, this uh, hotel is something the city's been looking for attracting, um, I've been here 16 years and I would say 15 of the 16. Um, we've done two hotel studies that show there's some demand um, for a hotel in the city. Um, this is uh, one of our primary commercial areas. Um, it is next to a residential neighborhood, but this area has been designated and um, zoned and guided for commercial for some time. And so the belief is that a hotel near that 42 and three intersection makes a lot of sense. It's centrally located, it has reasonably good access. Um, and so I think um, this has always been one of the areas that has been reviewed in the hotel studies, as well as in conversations with the Planning Commission and Council and other developers. Uh, there was a previous approval for a country and suites in this general location that was never built. Uh, so there is a history of uh, pre prior approval through the PUD when the gas station was approved um, on the memory care site. Um, this uh, regarding noise or complaints, um, they're subject to the same noise restrictions that all other commercial or residential entities have in terms of our noise ordinance um, or you know, it's similar to loud parties or those types of things from a nuisance perspective. And then there's also a noise ordinance that's very prescriptive related to the um, PCA requirements. Um, so um, that's kind of the history. I, I know it's been a, a, a very strong goal of the uh, council, um, existing council and prior councils to get a hotel in town. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Andy. I don't see any other hands at the time. I did have one individual type in that they are unable to unmute and ask their question. So they asked that we do it for them. So I will um, ask the questions on behalf of Catherine D. Wolf, and she is at 2662 148th Street West. 
Um, and she says, has been a resident here for 16 years, if that matters. Um, and let me see. So Catherine, I'm hoping I catch all of them. Um, I'm gonna start where I think her first one starts. In conjunction with the traffic study was a study done in regard to the trains that stop on the railroad tracks for sometimes 10 to 15 minutes without moving. With a good portion of the project being senior living, there will be an increased need for emergency vehicles needed to reach them. Um, she also goes on to ask about um, with an angle parking within the development, how will a car turn around if the parking spaces are filled and someone see, sees one on the opposite side? So kind of what that traffic flow and turnaround is for that um, angled parking on the two different directions. Where Business Parkway and 148th Street meet, residents on both sides of that corner use the street parking when they have guests. Currently, it's a blind corner without those guests, but there is an increased possibility of accidents when cars are parked on both sides of the intersection. When a train sits on the tracks for 10 to 15 minutes, traffic backs up east of Biscayne. How will a solid flow be good when you have the elderly trying to get to their apartment or emergency vehicles need to get to those businesses? So I believe those are all of her questions. And I think probably the majority of those, if not all of them are probably for staff with maybe the exception, I don't know who wants to address the parking. Um, um, Madam Chair, I just wanna be clear about one thing and then I think Kyle has answered and most of the other ones. This is a, it's a restricted um, independent living senior housing. So it's not a services, um, you know, Warren isn't proposing any services. Um, so it's just a, an age restriction for a, a market rate project. So um, I, it would be similar to like Bard's Crossing in town that is age restricted or the um, some, you know, the detached townhomes of um, uh, Couch Town and Kyle, what are those, pro what's that project? Couch Town and Cross, oh, Cross, Cross, Croft. Cross. Cross. Thank you. Should have asked you, Anthony. So it, it's that type of, product, it's not a um, service. You know, there's there's not um, the implication necessarily that there's a bunch of health issues. Not that anybody doesn't need uh, emergency access um, as does anybody else in the neighborhood, but. Right, but it would be emergency access just like the rest of the residents yes. in the neighborhood. Yeah. Okay, okay Kyle, take it away. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll try to go through the list here and, and let me know if I've, I've missed something. Um, so in terms of, of the trains, I think there was a couple questions related to that and how those were being studied. Uh, there really wasn't any, any part of the analysis that looked at trains specifically with the traffic study that was in your packet tonight. Uh, that was very much focused on comparing the two different kind of land use alternatives for the site and looking at what that might look like. Uh, I mean, trains are obviously an issue in the community because there's the railroad tracks that cross this Highway 42. And, you know, based on, on the evidence we hear from residents and what we see, you know, there are some times where that, you know, there's stacking and other things happening there that do cause some backups. Um, but we have that situation at several intersections in the community. And so this is something that, you know, being a community that, that has a railroad going through it is something we're gonna have to deal with. Um, I think that does uh, maybe stress the point that um, when it comes to providing access into both residential neighborhoods and commercial properties, uh, it, it is very important to have multiple mo ways to get in and out of those sites. Uh, so as we've approved projects, um, typically we're looking to have more than one entrance in, one access out. And that is the case here along 42 because you do have the ability to, uh, you not only go up Business Parkway, but Biscayne Avenue and then East and West, there are connections that, that provide access there. So it's, it's really not ideal um, that when there's long, you know, longer stoppages uh, along, Highway 42, uh, that vehicles are looking for alternative routes, but uh, given the location of the railroad, there's probably not a lot of other alternatives uh, short of having a, a major, um, you know, grade separated crossing or some other major, major project there, which, you know, may not be all that, that much in the, in the interest of the surrounding properties as well. Um, so I know that doesn't really answer the question, but um, I think from the perspective of this project, we've looked at that you know, kind of out as something that's outside the scope of, of this particular project, but something that is definitely part of the city's ongoing plans and discussions with both the county and, and the railroad and others about how those those different transportation corridors interact with each other. Um, I think I also want to note that the, the city is working with the county right now on, on a Highway 42 visioning study, uh, which is ultimately intended to help 
provide recommendations for improvements and ongoing improvements. So it, it's something that's being looked at now as part of that study uh, in terms of you know what impact that that railroad crossing has and, and where there are accesses now onto the highway. So we'll, we'll continue to, to look at those um, that situation and look at ways to improve the highway as we do our ongoing planning work with both the county and state and other entities that, that are affected by that. So that kind of leads into some other questions here. Um, there was a question about angled parking and how people get access. Uh, what the applicant's showing, at least for that, that segment that's uh, between uh, the hotel and the senior apartments is very typical of a downtown situation where there is you know, a desire to have more parking on the street. Uh, it essentially means that when you're pulling into and out of those parking stalls, you can only go one way. So if you're traveling south, you can pull directly in then head south again once you back out. If you're traveling north, you should be pulling in north and, and, backing, or, and backing out and heading north again. Um, staff felt that that was a much better option than what the applicant had proposed previously where there was 90 degree parking, where there is unrestricted movements and it, it becomes much more difficult once you're backing out to you know, one, be able to see the traffic, be able to account for you know, both movements. And so it really isn't practical to set it up that way. And it doesn't really function much different than if it were parallel parking, where in that situation, you only can pull in one way and exit one way out of those parking stalls. You just have a little more room to park and a few more stalls because of the, the way it's configured. Uh, so we don't see this being a major issue. And um, ultimately there should be uh, sufficient movement or uh, ability to move within the development uh, to turn around if you need to. And then uh, there's another question about trains. Uh, and then parking along Biscayne, um, is it business Parkway, or I think it was Business Parkway, right? Not Biscayne. Right, Business um, Parkway and 148th. You know, as a local street, I'm, I would imagine that there isn't any parking restrictions right now on, on Business Parkway. Uh, um, so the there idea- There are restrictions on 148th. Okay. So there are restrictions on 148th, none on Business Parkway right now for parking. Um, there um, are no restrictions on either um, either of those streets for parking. Well, there's a no parking sign on 148th on the south side. I think you're thinking of 149th, mm -mm. Kim, where the commercial area is. I am. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I will tell you no, Kim. There. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Well, this is definitely something we can look at. Um, I mean, for the most part, the city doesn't try to restrict parking on streets where there is sufficient room for the parking with, with parallel, parallel parking and so forth. If there are some specific concerns about certain intersections maybe becoming more difficult to see and so forth, we can take a look at that. Um, you know, ultimately the city does control parking on the street in those situations and can make modifications where it's necessary for the um, sufficient and adequate movement of vehicles and safety concerns. Um, but, you know, right now I think part of the problem is there, there isn't a lot of traffic on that road uh, compared to other roads in the community. Uh, and so I think just from a perspective of, of who's parking there now, it really hasn't been an, an issue. So. I think that's something the city can look into a little bit and, um, you know, get the planning commission or, or work with the, um, um, you know, the council if, if this moves forward on, on coming up with some ideas for, you know, if there's an issue or what we can do about that. Okay, I think that addresses the questions that she had asked. Um, I see a few more hands up. So, Anthony, you want to go ahead and call on somebody? You are muted if you are talking, Anthony. Sorry. Uh, Wayne is up next. He raised his hand. Okay, uh, this is Wayne Siso. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Please okay, state your perfect. name and address for the record. Uh, yes, it's Wayne Siso. Uh, I live at 14883 Brenner Court. And my question is around the proposed tree line. Are there any options of adding a berm there to raise those tree line height to kind of soften more of the view uh, privacy from the proposed uh, area to the current residential area. No, we'd be happy to do that. I don't... Okay, perfect. I, I just think that would help um, raise the height of the trees. It would, um, yep, you're right. Allow for more softer um, transition. Yep, that's a good idea. And, and viewing and privacy into the backyards as well. Thank you. Uh, that's the only question I had. Thank you, Thank Wayne. You. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have uh, it's they're listed William and Maria. Uh, you can go ahead and unmute. Hey, good evening. This is Will Mojica. I'm with my wife Maria. We live at uh, 2717 148 Street West. So, sort of the uh, the second house as you're entering into the residential area, and we kind of just had a 
kind of a similar question along the previous commentator uh, with respect to the privacy side of things. Uh, if there was consideration to also having kind of a fence line right along the Biscayne Avenue, or sorry, the uh, Business Parkway Avenue into 148. Uh, we have three little ones, a few of our other neighborhoods also have little ones with the blind corner uh, at the curve kind of being right there. Uh, we just kind of like a little more privacy in addition to if, if the berm is built, uh, having that fence line in addition to the tree line, just to kind of have that buffer, that barrier right there uh, at the ground level. I'm not real big on adding a fence. Um, I'd rather add more landscaping, even if it's a hedge than a, than a fence. A hedge would probably, you know, do a similar job as a fence would in terms of you know, keeping people from moving through that area, I guess. But I, I I'm, not, just I'm not in favor of a big fence. Yeah, I would just add too. In the if if it's within thirty feet of the right of way, the maximum height would be forty two inches. So the effectiveness of it really wouldn't be there. I think maybe if we add a hedge on top of the berm would be along with some more trees. Um, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission, just to further kind of comment on that too. In, in situations where the city does require um, either full screening or uh, like we talked about a 90% opacity screen. Uh, developers or the city have an option of, of putting a fence in to provide that screen. Uh, and I think Anthony is absolutely right that the only place that really would apply would be in that kind of north, extreme north, northwest portion of the site where there's a, um, a existing single family home. Um, otherwise you're along the street and, and there, um, Anthony's correct, you're limited then to the max height. And so it really doesn't become a screening fence then. So you still would need to rely on uh, either some kind of shrubbery or trees or something else to provide that screen. Thank you, Kyle and Anthony for jumping in there and commenting. Will, any other comments or questions? No, ma'am, not at this time, thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands raised right now. So I'm gonna um, see, I'm gonna scroll through the questions and see which of them we've answered as we've been talking and other questions have been answered. So there was one about the hotel um, and who will own it and what the purpose is. I believe we've answered that one. Um, there was a question about the plan for privacy for local residents with a three-story building looking right into the local residents. I feel like we've, we've talked about some um, privacy options, some landscaping, um, a berm, a hedge, doing privacy walls on the decks, um, things like that. There was a comment um, from, those were from an anonymous attendee, by the way, I did not have a name to connect them to. There was a comment from Brent Wasty. Is the developer opening to push the development further west to allow for more buffer and satisfy the requirement for more trees? So that could potentially be something maybe looked at with the landscaping plan of needing to add a hundred more trees in and where they go, or what, what kind of those options might be. Um, that one was asked live. And then there's another one, um, if there was a plan for helping 42 and Highway 3 intersection for traffic, including potential stop trains that spills into the neighborhoods. And I feel like, um, I feel like we've answered that one talking about the, the different traffic. So I think, and there was one from Josh on noise restrictions and um, I believe it was Andy who asked that question um, and was answered. I believe that covers the questions. Um, that were sent in via the question and answer option. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item this evening from the public? I got one more question that came in, hold on. Um, it is, oh, I may have missed, I, I apologize, I might've missed this one. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee again. Um, any, any projections that would show the effect the proposal would have on the current residential property value. And Kyle, do you wanna address that one? Yes, Madam uh, Chair, members of the Planning Commission, uh, looking at um, impact on adjacent property values isn't something that typically is done with, with a project or, or a proposal in front of the city. Um, 
you know, one of the requirements in through the PUD process is that the uh, planning commission does need to find that the application is is um, compatible and will not negatively impact the adjoining property um, of the site or next to the site. And we typically look at that through things like traffic impacts and, and noise and screening and all those things that we've we've talked about tonight. Thank you. So from that, I don't see any other questions in the question um, feature of Zoom nor any other hands raised. So last call for comments. And seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Go ahead, Commissioner Schmizek. Madam Chair, I move to close the public hearing. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Marlowe. Stacy, will you take roll? Rivera. Aye. Schmizek. Aye. Reed. Aye. Freeman. Aye. Marlowe. Uh, aye. Kenninger. Aye. Public hearing is now closed. Okay, so we've got um, a few things before us this evening. Just a reminder, the memory care um, portion of the recommendations was um, taken off. Um, you know, from the public hearing and from the applicant, I think we heard, um, you know, a lot of comments on some things that could be done with landscaping and berm um, and things like that. So I think we've got a, a few things before us that the commission can, um, choose to move forward with um, as we would like. Um, I, is there anyone that would like to make some comments at this time? Yes, Mr. Commissioner Schmizek. Madam Chair, um, I'm, I'm very intrigued with this project. I, I think, you know, Mr. Israelson is uh, a good developer. I think he has a, a good heart for the, the city and for the neighborhood in that he's willing to look at things. But, and, and, I, and I think this project kind of fits the needs of the city where we have the potential of bringing in more people. And I think very nicely, we're putting them right by a commercial area where we always hear that we need more people to develop a commercial area. And so I think this kind of development and, and certainly with a hotel will, will lead to making that commercial area more viable. However, for tonight, I, I think there's so many concerns and, and issues to look at yet. Um, I'm, I'm probably gonna lean and, and would want to lean towards continuing this to our next meeting, but I, I think that's just where I'm at. Thank you. Are there other comments from any of the commissioners at this time? It's Mike, I, I would just, I would, I would reflect what Commissioner Shmusik said, uh, just said. Um, generally in favor of it. There are a lot of open questions and landscaping is a big one. Some of the, um, and, and I really appreciate the flexibility uh, Mr. Israelson brought. Uh, some of those options around the privacy panels and berms and working with the neighbors I think is important. I, um, I think thinking of it as a landscape dedication, kind of like we think of park dedications, but if you need to do that on the side, you know, not part of the overall package that's in front of us, I think that'd be a good way to do it too. Thank you, Commissioner Reed. Any other comments from commissioners? Commissioner Freeman. Yeah, um, I would just like to echo uh, what Commissioner Schmizek and Reed said. I agree. Um, I am also, I think this is a very interesting project and I think there are aspects of it that are very unique and also very needed in the community. And I do agree though, that there are just too many outstanding issues like with the the layout and landscaping, and I think we should continue it. But overall, I, I do like the project quite a bit with this. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay, I will, um, I do have a few comments and so I will um, share them. Um, I do appreciate Mr. Israelison's um, flexibility this evening. And I think the project that he has brought forward is, is much needed. And being a resident in this neighborhood, um, I have wanted to see this land 
developed into something for many years. So I am excited to see something that's that's coming forward. Um, and I think there can be a good fit with the neighbors that um, and with the adjacent residential that it buds up to. Um, I appreciate your your flexibility in talking about the landscaping. Um, the berm, I think, is a great is a great addition. The privacy wall on um, the decks, I think, is something that would be nice to be looked at. Um, and kind of, I too would like to see it continued and see more on the landscaping and what what can be done with um, some of the landscaping. I think the overall concept of the project is good. I do think um, a hotel is something for as long as I can remember being on the planning commission and on the committees I served for the city prior to that um, has been talked about. And so, and I was um, part of this commission when it came forward last time for this property. So, um, and was sad to see it not move forward. So I am excited to see, see that come forward again as well. Um, so I, I too am in favor of continuing this item, but um, am very much in support of doing something here. Um, my biggest concerns um, are the height of the buildings. And I think we talked about some options. Um, the, you know, I, I don't really, I like the idea of the, the roof line um, and not having it flat. I don't know what um, those options are, but I think a 50% height increase variance is, is a big one. So um, I'd love to, to engage in some discussions on what some options um, may be there. I also think the, um, you know, that access, you know, if you're open to eliminating it and um, city staff has no concerns, it looks like there's still a couple accesses to the property that would spill out onto 149th um, and then could access the roads from there. I think that would be a great option as well and um, take it away from that curve there um, and such. So I think that that would be something to look at. Um, and I did mention the landscape and I think Commissioner Freeman had some good comments on um, some of the trees and I think staff had commented on the ash. So I think kind of looking at what those would be as well would be good um, to look at. I think, you know, working with the neighbors too, I think um, being one of the neighbors to this property, I think that there are many neighbors that would be willing to, to meet with the developer as well and um, have conversations if the developer is open to it. Um, but I, I am excited to see something come forward and I do appreciate, as Commissioner Schmizek said, the, the thoughts you've put into the, um, in working with staff um, as well into the placement of the buildings and the design of the buildings versus trying to come through with one large um, residential building, um, you know, or one large apartment building versus the, the small ones. I think that that does fit that neighborhood feel a lot better. Um, I had a couple other small things and I apologize. I move a lot of paper around during our meetings here. Um, you know, so if this does continue, a couple of things that I that I would love to hear on um, maybe next time. I know in the staff report, there was a comment that no signage has been requested. I think it would be um, kind of nice to know what the thought is for signage and make sure that it's not gonna end up being kind of anywhere a, right across from any of the residents that it's pushed more to the south. Um, and then also a phasing plan and timeline and construction traffic. I guess those are a few things that we didn't really um, cover in the conversation. So I think those would be some things that maybe could be talked about there and construction traffic. I know um, Mr. Israelison, the neighborhood saw traffic when the apartments, um, Rosewood Commons, I think is the name, the apartments to the north of this property when development started there, um, there was traffic from those apartments through the neighborhood. And so I think um, just making sure that the construction traffic is is not gonna route through the neighborhood would be um, helpful for the neighbors to know. So those are my, some of my comments. And I do support your, I do support your comment on the fence as well. I think um, I had initially, had asked some questions about a fence, but I, you know, hearing the height restrictions and I think the hedge may look softer um, along the street there. So it might be a better um, option, but maybe that neighbor, the one neighbor that's in the corner there, um, you know, there could be some discussion with them on what they would prefer right adjacent to their property since I think they're the ones with the parking lot. Okay, so what would be the next steps? So, think? yep, so I think at this, 
at this time. Um, if no other commissioners have any comments, we could entertain a motion and we have a few before us that we can either entertain motions to move forward, but I think the majority of the commission is looking to um, move to continue it. So um, we will move forward right. with that. With that, and then um, Warren, you can work on some of the comments tonight um, with staff and um, pulling together some additional information and landscaping and incorporation of maybe the, some of the things talked about tonight with the berm and updating the landscaping plan and things like that um, to move forward. Okay. Are there any other comments from the commissioners? Okay, seeing none, we could entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to continue the request until the July 28th, 2020 Planning Commission in order to provide the applicant additional time to A, update the landscape plan to bring it into conformance with the zoning ordinance, B, revise all development drawings to reflect the updated parking and driveway layout for the hotel and apartment area, C, provide additional information about the visual impact of the apartment buildings, and D, address other concerns from the Planning Commission and public. Is there a second? Madam Chair, I'll second. It's been seconded by Commissioner Schmizek. And Stacy, will you take roll? Kenninger. Aye. Marlow. Aye. Freeman. Aye. Reed. Aye. Schmizek. Aye. Rivera. Aye. Motion passes. This item will be continued to our July. And Commissioner Reed, I know you said it, but I don't have it in front of me. 28th. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. July 28th meeting. Okay. Next. See you next month. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Israelison. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. That concludes the public hearing section of this evening's meeting. And at this time, we do have two more items on the agenda of which I've managed to lose. Um, we have two discussion items on the agenda. Um, I will just take a quick raise of hands if anyone wants to take a few minute break. We've been going for a couple hours. So it looks like Commissioner Freeman is voting for a break and a few others. So we will take a five minute um, recess break and we will reconvene at 9.06.
Ryan, are you joining us for um, a certain item tonight or just kind of for fun? You're muted if you're talking. Hold yeah, <laughs> I was look. I was looking for the right button to push. So, <laughs> no, I was. Uh, I was here primarily for the uh, for the discussion with the discussion. one item. Oh, okay. I know a lot of times we just have we just get Stephanie, which she is wonderful too. But I sometimes you pop in. So yeah. <laughs> well, I'm hoping to make more of an appearance on uh, and, and be more regular. So. Got it. Once, once the real meetings start back up, not that this isn't a real meeting, but the in-person one. The in-person, yeah. Yeah. So I'll find my spot in the back corner generally. <laughs> Got it. I don't mind the Zoom ones, but tonight I felt like I had paper flying every which way. It's been five minutes. It's been five minutes, 9.06 right now. Then I'm right on time. You're right on time. I know I run so fast to go to the bathroom and come back and it's been like three minutes. I'm like, oh, well, yeah. his work for tonight he's done no he's coming back okay um no never um, mind they're both you okay we, we need to come back our commissioner read if you're back please let us know well he changed the picture didn't he yeah he's got a picture up but i'm not sure if he's really there there he is Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I wanted to confirm you were you were there before we started back up. Okay, we will start back up. Our next um, section this evening is a discussion section, and make sure I have the first one first. Um, we will be discussing a um, item related to new small lot residential zoning district, and Anthony will step us through this discussion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is something that kind of comes up occasionally whenever we have a PUD um, request for a new subdivision in our single family areas in the eastern part of the city, uh, mostly around the Akron um, 42 um, up to Bonaire area um, that we, uh, the commission has noticed that a lot of the uh, lot standards that are included in these planned unit developments are uh, fairly consistent uh, from one to the other and that um, perhaps um, we should maybe consider adding an additional zoning district um, or uh, coming up with some way to uh, codify the standards that are included in these planned unit developments um, to uh, create some clarity and, and uh, further uh, identify what we are looking for with regards to development in, in those parts of the city. So um, this is more of a discussion to get some feedback from the commission um, about uh, one, the standards that would maybe be uh, included and two, would this be, uh, a f is this something that we would wanna move forward with um, having a separate zoning ordinance or a separate zoning district um, in, that, in that or other parts of the city. So um, I'm just gonna start by sharing my screen. Uh, I've got a short PDF here. Um, and you guys can all um, follow along. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you see that right now? Is that showing up my yes. summary? Yep. Okay. 
Yep, we can see it. I'll do a full screen here. Um, so um, I kind of already went through this, uh, that the vast majority of the developments are, are uh, approved through the PUD process. Uh, the purpose is to allow developers some flexibility uh, in the design of the subdivisions. Um, mostly uh, that's really to allow for um, the, the developer to maintain or preserve natural features like topography, wetlands, um, wooded areas. Um, and then through the PUD process, the city is also able to ask for some um, conditions of approval, um, some enhancements. Uh, most, most commonly, um, we see them in additional sidewalks or trails, some um, enhanced landscaping as screening, um, and then also our uh, requirements for exterior building materials, uh, uh, reduced amount of lap siding, uh, stone wainscoting, brick or stone wainscoting, or um, uh, side loading garage, which is incredibly rare in these um, smaller lot uh, plan unit developments. So, um, so there's a couple benefits to actually adopting a new uh, zoning district that um, has lot standards that are similar to what we're seeing in the planned unit developments. Um, and that's that uh, the developers can uh, uh, go through just the regular approval process without a PUD agreement that includes deviations from the zoning ordinance. Uh, it's a more clear cut process. Uh, it does eliminate some of the uh, uh, negotiations that take place um, between staff and the developer prior to um, a re formal request being made. Um, and, and that's basically because the ordinance is clearly articulating the requirements. And if the developer is meeting those with their proposed subdivision or plat, uh, they ha it has to be approved. Um, there is a drawback um, that to adopting a new zoning district is that if the, if the developer does meet those, as I just said, then it, it does have to be approved. Um, we're not able to, as a city, require those additional enhancements um, that, that uh, normally we do ask for with developments. Um, that's not to say that those wouldn't occur um, on their own. Um, the, the planned unit developments generally are um, a reflection of the market for developments to occur. Uh, as far, mostly as far as the exterior building materials, I know some developers are less excited about putting in additional landscaping or um, sidewalks or trails um, just from a cost standpoint. So just to allow the commission to have an understanding of what the standards are in our um, more recent planned unit developments that were approved, um, I broke out the, the lot standards that generally um, include deviations that are approved through the PUD process. Um, Bella Vista probably has the largest uh, minimum lot area, which is still below the 10,000 square foot standard that would be in an R1 zoning district. Um, you can see it also has some larger, larger or wider lots. Um, that being said, it does have larger homes. So it does feel kind of just as um, cozy, I guess you could say, with regards to setbacks and things like that. Um, so it goes from Bella Vista, from the lot area size, the largest, to um, Dunmore and Doolin Heights are two smaller, um, small, or features the smallest lots. Um, those also I want to uh, remind the commission is that just because it does have a minimum lot area, um, generally through the planned unit development process, this is, uh, those smallest lots are usually um, limited to just one or two in a few tight odd corners um, that might exist due to the either the layout of the site itself or to make connections with existing streets at the boundaries of the of that development. Uh, otherwise Prestwick Place, Meadow Ridge, Emerald Isle and Greystone are all pretty consistent. The only two that actually included lot areas and um, and uh, differences were the Presswick Place and Greystone that had, uh, it broke out the corner lots um, from the interior lots. And um, from a staff standpoint, that isn't as important because a corner lot still does need to meet a street side yard setback um, if it is against the, um, 
a, another lot that has a front yard that butts up to the rear of, of that corner lot. Um, so it does require a larger lot anyways, due to those larger setbacks. And then I, um, again, on the bottom, the lot coverage, we've been improving a sliding scale based on the uh, size of the lot. The larger the lot, the smaller percentage it does receive um, as far as a maximum lot coverage goes. And I think in, in our conversations it, with, within internally, probably a sliding scale is not the best thing to put into a code. We should probably find a percent and just put it in there or stick to it. Um, I do wanna share some, uh, some other cities that have adopted smaller lot, uh, single family zoning districts um, and just three kind of similar or um, similar in, in age or seeing the development that we're seeing in our, in our newer areas were Egan, Lakeville and Plymouth. And as you can see, the, the standards are generally consistent um, with those of our planned unit developments here in Rosemount. Um, one thing to note, Egan's lot coverage, they call it building coverage. They don't do impervious or lot cover. It's just the area covered by buildings, um, which is where they get the 20% or 2000 square feet, which is much lower. Um, but I would assume that that's pretty consistent with what our building coverage is um, in our new developments, um, you know, subtracting the, the driveway and, and sidewalk area. Um, otherwise, Lakeville has a 40% lot coverage and Plymouth has 35% lot coverage, um, which is, is pretty tight um, for, a, for a small lot. Um, so those are all the slides I have. I, I'm just going to go back to what our planned unit developments are here, um, just for the sake of, of conversation and um, maybe just let the Planning Commission share some initial thoughts um, about, about how we would move forward and, and, and if you see it being uh, a good idea to create an additional residential zoning district. Um, and before I, before I move on to, I, I should say that when I found these zoning districts in the other cities, they had a number of single family zoning districts from estate residential, which is probably more similar to our rural residential, all the way down to these small lot single family uh, residential. So uh, it wouldn't be unheard of to have one more um, residential zoning district. Thanks, Anthony. Can you actually, I've got a, um, I'll start off some other questions mm -hmm. and comments here. Can you go to the, the other slide that you just had up? Yeah, that one. It, it does it seem interesting to you? I guess I'm trying to, to grasp the difference on the, for Lakeville, why their corner lots are allowed to be so much smaller than their interior lots. You know what? their corner lot width is higher. Yeah, I think that's a typo. Got actually, it. Actually, when I was copying okay. and pasting it from a Word document. Got it. I Sorry. thought that seemed strange. That's okay. I just was really confused on to how they how they do it. Um, so, you know, it, I guess part of my you mentioned some of the things we wouldn't get with, um, you know, materials, additional landscaping, um, sidewalks and trails. Um, I just wanted to confirm materials to some extent are already there's already in the zoning ordinance, some requirements on materials. It's just sometimes when we allow deviations, we require additional. A mix of materials or something like okay. that. Okay. And then obviously there's already landscaping requirements um, and there's also already sidewalk requirements for our developments, correct? Right, right. But we have had some approvals where the planning commission has said, you know, I think this this street needs to have sidewalks on both sides. Both sides, right, both right. Sides. So you'd lose that. Um, okay. But if it, if it's something that was shown in the in the um, like the trails and in in our plans, those would have to be accounted for and included in a subdivision. Okay. It's just anything beyond that. Okay. Sounds good. And um, so my I guess where I'm at is, you know. I think we've been allowed to to request some things, but I do think that there is there is um, a positive in allowing a zoning district that that allows developers to move forward without having to always do a PUD um, if they meet certain requirements. Um, 
And especially like with, you know, we've been doing seven and a half feet side yard setbacks for as long as I can remember. And um, we have also talked for a while about changing, doing something to change that so we don't have to see it, everything that just comes in and that's like the only deviation that they're asking for. So I think that there is some, some positive to it. Um, you know, I think if staff is not concerned with, with the pieces we'll lose, by not being able to ask for some of these additional things, I think it can be good. Um, my, I would agree that I don't think we should do ranges. Um, I think we've got to pick a number for maximum lot coverage and um, and go with that percent. And they do would have to come in if they're requesting something different. Same with the lot width where there's a range. I think I think we need to look at it and and set a number and not have a a range there. Any. And and I don't think that um, having an additional zoning district is going to mean that we won't ever have a planned unit development request. I, I'm sure that we're going to get something. Um, it's just that when we have a lot of these developments that are occurring in, in fields that are generally um, flat or maybe just rolling but not steep, um, there aren't a lot of, there's a lot of, it's a lot easier to subdivide that than say the Doolin Heights where there are slopes and wooded areas and you know maybe trying to squeeze a couple lots here to save some area there. Um, right. Okay. Thoughts, comments from the other commissioners, feedback for staff. Anthony, if you want to go back to that other slide where you had all of the recent of it, yeah, that might be helpful for others. And, and also, um, you know, what, once we get some direction from the Planning Commission, we'll work with the engineering department, especially with that lot coverage and how it would impact our stormwater management um, plans and what would really work with that. Uh, yeah, I'm just curious, if you look across the board here, Anthony, at, at the ones that are on the table, um, how many of these, you know, would not, uh, would, would we have treated differently? if we did have a zoning, a new zoning uh, ordinance in place. And, and then generally too, are, are there things that we have uh, negotiated for that we may not have gained here? Did, did you say, are there things that we've negotiated for that? Yeah, so I mean, just a, a couple of things I'm thinking. Number one is, if you look at the ones across the board here, um, how, how much of these would have been different, would have not had to come through with a PUD if we had the new zoning ordinance? And secondarily, um, do you recall uh, things that we've negotiated for, like landscaping, you brought up some good examples that we, we may have lost if we didn't have that capability? Yeah. Well, you know, I think the most, the most recent example would have been Doolin Heights where we really worked to um, give the, get that extra room between the existing development and the new development and, and provide some additional landscaping along that, um, that eastern side that was, that was uh, adjacent to the existing development. So that's probably the most recent and clear um, example from that. Um, you know, Meadow Ridge had some wetlands in there that they had to work around. Um, and Bella Vista also was another one um, that we had to get, you know, there's additional natural features and things like that. It's yeah, so like doing hikes, using that as an example then. I mean, would we still have been able to in other ways negotiate for that additional space like you just described? No, not if they came in with a with a plat that met all the the requirements of the ordinance. Okay. Right, but in this case, Doolin Heights lot area was seven thousand square feet, and if it looks like staff's recommendation is eight thousand square feet, so then in that case, Doolin Heights still would have had to be a PUD. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, yeah, and and okay. the staff recommendation is just kind of throwing it out there. I mean, right, right, but but if if Doolin Heights was eight, if we went with eight thousand, let's just pretend for example sake, if we'd gone with 8,000, if Doolin Heights met the 8,000, we would have never, we wouldn't have seen it, we wouldn't have been able to put the condition in for the um, extra coverage or landscaping. The, um, but if it was at the 7,000, then we would have seen it and had that opportunity. Right, right. Okay. I think the Doolin Heights example is a really good, is a good example of where the PUD process is really effective um, because there is a lot of, um, there was a lot of things that the city wanted, whereas Emerald Isle um, as a development uh, was in the middle of a field. 
Um, I think the the developer, if there were some lots, you know, I think it, they they base their subdivisions and how they draw their plats on the standards. And you know, Emerald Isle very likely would have came in and and maybe their their minimum lot area is eighty one twenty five. But if it was like eighty five, they would have maybe just gone through the regular process and met that standard because there's no real uh, steep slopes or trees or anything that they would maybe try to preserve. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anthony, on this, so we've got recommendations that you have provided. Can you, and if it's in here, I apologize. Um, I know I looked it up online, but I don't didn't of course write it down. What the current, like the um, current lot area requirement is. So what would the current single family kind of normal residential? Well, I. Um, and I, lot with. Yeah, I um, have it. Okay, Thank I you. thought I had put it in there. Yeah. My apologies. Um, so the, the standard R1 is um, interior lots are 10,000 and corner lots are 12 interior lots are 80 feet wide and corner lots are 95. And the setbacks are the same except for the side yard, is that correct? The, the front is 30 feet and the 30, side. Okay. Yeah, 30, 10 and 30. Okay. With a and 30 the max lot coverage. What was the percent? 30. 30%. Yeah. Okay, I, thank you. If I could just add two points that are not directly connected to what we were just talking about. Um, one, most of, we're in the habit of not rezoning property until the project comes before you. So the rezoning does allow the city to have some conversation with the developer. Um, however, you know, the, generally the, the, you know, if they meet the standards, then they meet the standards and they're entitled to be approved. So you lose your, you know, some of that flexibility or negotiation. Um, and then the other point that I think was mentioned earlier um, is we require um, across the board now, these three architectural standards, which are not in the straight up zoning. So it's a porch, wainscoting, or a mix of materials, which I know you did mention, Anthony, that, but I guess none of those are required under this, the regular zoning. So- Would we be able to require them in this new um, zoning classification or not? We can, yes, but I also think then why wouldn't we just require it across the board? For right, I, I agree. I agree, but I think as you're going smaller in lots and smaller in size, um, you know, there might be more tendency to to skip some of those architectural elements if they're not required. I don't think these condi the ex the architectural standards haven't been overly onerous given looking at their, you know, the elevations that come in. I think we're pretty flexible. You know, it's like a porch that's 30% or the Wayne's coating, or it's, we've even gone with just a mix of materials. So they're still siding, but they could be the shake and the flap. And so I think we're just, again, just going for the variation, which some developers just don't do, or they don't want to do because they've got um, customers who want very similar buildings, you know, a certain way. So I think that might be something we might want to talk about um, too, you know, either as part of this new district or really just in the low density residential areas. Yeah, I, I would agree that I think my if we're if we're creating this one to me, we should include those architectural standards at a minimum in here since we're creating this new as a new one. Um and gonna see them not be able to do it via a PUD process. Any other comments from 
commission thoughts on kind of the lot areas and lot widths, you know, compared to what the current R1 zoning is and what's what staff has laid out? I personally, I think the, you know, the setbacks, I don't think are a problem. Um, you know, I, I prefer to go with 65 feet on the lot width. It seems like, you know, um, over half of the projects shown on the screen have been at 65 feet that we would see, we would have seen two of the um, projects come through PUD without it, but at um, five of the projects we wouldn't have if I did my, or three, we would have seen three of them and not, and four of them would have gone through without it. So that's kind of where I am, I think, um, in terms of that. Um, you know, um, I also would go with the lower maximum lot coverage. Again, it'll allow some to go through without PUD, but it will, those ones that are gonna have more lot coverage would, would come forward, um, is my opinion. And, and I'm open on the lot area. I, of course, like larger, larger lots, but that's just a personal preference. And I know in this day and age, people are looking for a small lot, small maintenance. So I think market has showed us that. Yeah, I just have one comment on the lot area. <clears throat> um, I moved from Western Rosemount off of Shannon Parkway and 144th Street to Prestwick place and um, you know, one thing I did notice is my lot isn't impacted as much, but quite a few lots have the drainage swale in the backyard um, and the smaller lots, their actual usable space for a backyard gets shrunken down because it, half the yard is sloped to that drain, drainage ditch. So just something that I, I think 8,000 in my opinion, is the minimum, which you have, but maybe bump it up to 8,500. Yeah, I mean, even going 8,500 is, you know, is 1,500 lower than what it is today. So I think that is a, as a fair amount. And again, we could, I think what we've done is in some of these developments like Doolin Heights, they have a lot or two that maybe are 7,000 square feet, but the rest of them are higher. So then I think if, you know, if you had 8,500 and, you know, you look at the lots and yeah, you've got one that's 8,000 or something, um, we can have flexibility with it. It would have to come through a PUD then, but that'd be what it is. Any other comments from commissioners, direction for staff? Yes, Commissioner Schmizek. Madam Chair, the, the thing I, I struggle with is I don't I don't want to lose the ability to make sure those enhancements are done. I mean, I, I think it's very important to be able to create that neighborhood that that we you know that over time where where we we put in those things and 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 ask the developer to do it are critical. I, I, I must admit I, I was really surprised when we moved here. Uh, from our, our former home that in that city, there was not a development that did not have sidewalks on both sides of the street. And that was, that was just amazing to me that here there are so many that just have a sidewalk on one side. Um, so those kinds of things I think are really important in neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods where you have kids and, and that type of thing. Uh, and so, I struggle with trying to come up with the standard, but lose some of those, like I said, those enhancements that really generate a very nice neighborhood. Staff, what are your your thoughts with Commissioner Schmizek's comments in terms of it, to what extent? I mean, if we put if we put in the architectural standards. And stuff. I mean, we don't do side. I, um, I agree. I've got sidewalks on both sides of my neighborhood, um, and appreciate that. But we don't. We don't do that in many of the neighborhoods here, even now when they do come through PUDs. So, what is? To what extent do you feel like? How much are we going to lose? I guess is maybe the bulk of my question. 
let me get to the point. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point that we aren't really requiring sidewalks on both sides of every street. It's just that when, when it does come up, it's more of a, um, a call out of a specific need um, that's identified um, based on the layout of the site. Um, so I, you know, as far as our ability to require that, um, you know, I, I guess I would maybe defer to Kim on how hard you want to push on something like that. Um, you know, when we're trying to do our initial meeting with the developers, um, but since we're not really doing that and that's not really the, the I guess, philosophy Standard. in our city to have sidewalks on both sides, what, you know, whether that's right or wrong isn't really the, the question right now, but um, we, you know, we aren't really asking for that all that often, unless it's an existing sidewalk system that a development's tying into. Um, and and, then and if, if we have that, so if we, in the cases where we did ask for it and it, and it made sense given the layout of the neighborhood, um, would we be, would, would there be an opportunity through the zoning piece of it to and request that, that potentially? Yeah, that's one thing that Kim had mentioned is that we do, you know, we, the rezoning piece offers some negotiation. So it isn't that we can't ask for it ever. Right. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, it, we run the risk if, if they met all of the standards, but for needing the rezoning, then you really, um, you know, you don't have as much leverage. I mean, I think it's just, um, I'm going to, I'm going to go with a, like, it's kind of a personality trait. I like to always kind of hedge my bet. And so it's easier if we go in with the most flexibility possible. Um, I think other people um, are more comfortable that, you know, if you meet the standard, they're entitled to the approval, um, which I think, you know, which they are. And I think we try to be consistent about that. Um, what worries me after 35 years is that you um, never think of all the options um, when they come up. And so then you write an ordinance you feel pretty good about, it, and then somebody does something and you think, huh. Oh, Look at that, they can do that by a, by permitted use. Or and you're like, never thought about that one. So um the you know, just it that I don't I don't mind the PUD. Um, but I know that Pam, who is in here in particular, has felt uncomfortable um consistently using that. And I think a few of you also felt that way because we're so um consistently moving on to this, like we have this this kind of secret standard for, for new neighborhoods that um, we use without it really being tied into the zoning. So, I mean, I think I can understand that. Um, the other option I thought about is I worked in a different city where we did small lot PUD. So it's a rezoning, it's, it's um, you know, housed under the PUD section and it allows you to have um, variation from the R1 through a small lot process. And that might, might be a little bit of both. Um, so that would still give us the flexibility to require things? I'm thinking about it, yeah. yeah. I guess, I mean, you know, it does, it does seem cumbersome for us to have to go through the PUD process for where it is consistent, where we're consistently approving it. But um, mm -hmm. at the same time, it it does give us the ability to look at the whole layout and and understand to what degree they're asking for variances and exceptions. Um, so I personally don't mind it. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I, I don't. I don't. I don't mind it. I, I think I do like that flexibility. And, and honestly, Kim, our community development uh, director, <laughs> um, no one's and, watching. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> when I when I first came on, I was I was I think if I even voiced it, I I saw all these variances and I didn't really understand why we were allowing so many variances. But it makes a lot of sense. You know, the market's looking for smaller lots. But going through this, I, I do like that flexibility. I think we've probably walked away with some better communities as a result. So I, I, you know, I, I think I, I'd be in favor of, 
uh, not updating it right now. Well, or maybe we can explore that that small lot PUD business a little bit more. Um, I, you know, after I just kind of told you what I really like, I mean, the one thing is that kind of um, um, affirming it somewhere um, makes it a little bit maybe more palatable to neighborhoods. You know, I think often residents in existing neighborhoods are a bit confused why we're going through this process and what why does it qualify for an exception and why are we giving people exceptions um so i, I mean i can see kind of both sides from kind of a public understanding process too and and um so maybe there's some um in the middle and i think that is the the hard part is when it you know when it's a new development that isn't isn't butting up to an existing development or it's, you know, um, I think the neighborhood interest is very low, but, you know, when we do have those, those unique developments where there is, where they are being put by some existing neighborhoods, um, I do agree, it could be a good communication method. So maybe, maybe that's an option to look into is, is what you mentioned, Kim, and bring that back to us. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from the commissioners or direction for staff? on this item. Anthony, do you feel like we have a plan forward at this point? Yeah, I think so. I think this was pretty productive and helpful. Sounds good. So we will conclude this discussion item and move on to our last discussion item of the evening. And this is um, a discussion regarding a zoning ordinance tax amendment related to transmission facilities and essential services. So this is, uh, this is my item again. I don't, have a, um, I don't have slides for this one because there isn't a lot of tables to really talk about with regards to this. Um, so I'll just kind of briefly talk about what, what essential services and transmission facilities are um, and what, uh, why staff thinks that we need to look at this. Um, so the zoning ordinance has a couple things called essential services and transmission facilities that are related to the provision of utilities, um, so energy or power, natural gas, pipelines, um, I guess cable or anything like that could be considered an essential service as well. Um, and then our zoning ordinance defines transmission facilities as those that um, are um, separate from what would bring those utilities specifically to a house and more that, that carry that um, across the, the city. And our zoning ordinance specifically says that transmission facilities are, are um, energy power lines um, over a certain kilowatt and pipelines over a certain pressure that carry natural gas. And so the pushback that we're getting is that, well, our pipeline isn't carrying natural gas, so we aren't a transmission facility. Um, so that's an easy change I think staff is, is thinking that we could make by, by removing that spe specification that it's only limited to natural gas. Uh, but additionally, just because it doesn't carry natural gas doesn't mean that a pipeline isn't ha doesn't have the same impacts or land use implications that another pipeline carrying natural gas would have. And so staff feels like we should be able to rec regulate um, regulate a, a pipeline regardless of what is being carried by it. Um, there's a second component to that in that we have a transmission facility permit, which is similar to a conditional use permit. It's a public, process, public hearing process. Um, uh, there's a set of conditions that must be met with regards to uh, the uh, installation or approval of our transmission facility. And that is limited to um, pipelines that are over one quarter mile in length, which generally isn't, is, doesn't eliminate that many of them because they're all much longer than that. And they generally go through a lot of different people's properties. So the public hearing process is, is helpful because um, underground pipelines aren't super um, noticeable uh, and especially with directional drilling um, the work that occurs within that area might not even be known by the property owners um, through which 
uh, the pipeline uh, through through whose property the pipeline runs. So the public hearing process is really helpful in that in that case, uh, because the the transmission facilities um, requirement has the quarter mile um, threshold. Uh, there have been pipeline projects that uh, are proposed that are over a quarter mile, um, but are all within um, one single site. So specifically, this would be the Flint Hills um, refinery over at Pine Bend. Um, the, the refinery from the northernmost point to the southernmost point is uh, 1.75 miles. So they could have a pipeline within their, within their facility entirely um, and still have to go through the public hearing process for a transmission facility that they are questionable on whether or not they support because it doesn't carry natural gas. So uh, the two points that staff are looking for some feedback or discussion on are updating the definition of transmission facilities. Uh, should we remove that natural gas uh, specification? Um, I think staff is supportive of that change. And do we, should we still be requiring that should we update the zoning ordinance or the, or the, the city code to um, maybe allow a waiver from the public hearing process for a pipeline that is located all within a single property or within land owned by a single uh, property owner, such as Flint Hills. Kim, did I get that? This is really a muddy kind of weird <laughs> uh, thing that doesn't come up that often. Uh, the only thing I would add is I don't, um, you know, we have talked about the idea of maybe just changing the criteria for the petition. Um, I, I don't know. I, I really struggle with this because, you know, they're still held to the same standards, whether it's all on their property or not. Um, and so um, similar to lots of things, we regulate them, but don't permit them. You know, so we're just, they're just held to those, those standards. But then um, where do you draw the line? You know, if they don't own it later, or those kinds of things. So I think that's one reason why we wanted to come here. Uh, Flint Hills um, does has, have a very specific interest in this and we're going to end up meeting with them to talk about this because they are um, concerned about getting embroiled in, um, you know, regulations that they would prefer not to. Um, but so I think we need to be sensitive about that. But I think, you know, as, as Anthony mentioned, that um, pipeline project that went through the city not too long ago, I think it was really beneficial that we went through this process because so many people did not understand what it meant at all. Um, you know, trees being removed, even though they had easements, trees being removed and timing and wetlands and all sorts of things. Um, so I think there's some public purpose to it. Okay, anything else, Anthony or Kim, before we have discussion? Okay, so I think let's start with the first piece. Um, I think it might, might be the simpler piece. I'm not sure, we'll see how everyone feels. So the first piece that staff is asking about is updating the definition and removing um, the specification to natural gas. I personally feel like that's not um, that's not a, a real issue. It, it makes it more broad. So it gives us more, um, more control by removing the reference to natural gas. Um, I don't see any, I personally don't have any concerns with it. Any other commissioners have any feelings on the removal of that. I've seen a lot of head shaking. No, so it sounds like we're all we're all in favor of something to remove the word natural the words natural gas. And based on other cities' codes, they they don't specify what is within the pipeline okay. either. Okay, so I think that would be good to just call out as we go through this um, when it comes forward in a formal format. Um, the second piece, the waiver um, for a public hearing process of a single landowner and and such. Um, I have a couple questions and I'm gonna start with this one, Kim. You had mentioned that Flint Hills doesn't wanna get tied up with regulations. Um, but if I understand correctly, the only, would, the only thing that would change here would be the fact of no public hearing. Is the public hearing one of the things that they don't want to do? 
Is that really the only change that this would make? It would, it, well, it's a permitting process. So, yeah. I mean, we would have to, we'd still have to approve it. Um, yeah. But it's just right. what the threshold would be. So well, you would have to approve it, but it wouldn't come before the planning commission at all and there'd be no public hearing. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a public hearing, it's a public process, um, but it's also a timing, you know, because we have to publish and notify. So, you right. know, you're looking at about 60 days. Um, the other thing I think from uh, their perspective, often they're the only pe public. I mean, that's right. So they feel like they're the only ones coming within their par property. Right. right. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to that, but I'm concerned you can't really regulate like, you know, because you think about your house. Well, then, so anything I can do on my own property that only affects me is okay, which is not the way zoning works. Yeah, and and I guess I don't, I don't know this, and I don't know that they would, um, it, that this would happen, but, but they've bought a lot of property um, to the east to the west of their refinery um and so really if they were going to do any pipeline work on that not that i don't know if they would do pipeline work on that buffer property that they've purchased but it could be close to homeowners and because it's their same property there would be no public hearing and notification for those homeowners that are maybe right adjacent to the work or something again i don't know the likelihood of them going out to that buffer property and doing any pipeline work. But um, again, if it was something where it's all within their property, that still is their property. Well, that could, that, that doesn't have to be the trigger. The trigger could still be a length. It just maybe yeah. isn't a quarter mile. Yeah. I think that their, or their example is that they have so much pipeline as part of their operations. Right. And so the question maybe is that we um, we trigger the the public process, um, you know, with a different criteria. So maybe if there was if there was residential, or another landowner, so maybe not even residential, but another landowner within X number of feet of the location of that pipeline, you know, because you could put a if they're going to do a pipeline and you do a 500 foot radius to that, you might not hit anybody because it's all on their property, like. There's no one within 500 feet of it. And I'm just trying to think, I don't want to back to kind of our previous discussion item where we had conversation of, we don't want to do something and then and then have something come through and look and say, oh, we didn't think of that. Look at what we just created and have public. I mean, you know, you're dealing with, you know, things like this are, um, you know, pipelines are, or something that public is going to want to know if it's close or running through their property or things like that or coming close to their property. Any, yes, Commissioner Rivera. I guess I, I'm trying to understand like exactly what they're asking. Like, is there an example? Uh, because it's, you know, it's a refinery and, you know, for, for the comment to be say, we just don't want to have to deal with so much regulation. It's like, well, you're a refinery and you should be dealing with regulation. So I'm, I guess I'm looking for an example oh. of what we were actually talking about. Well, and I, um, perhaps I was being a little too flippant. So I, I don't wanna, they, they haven't been, you know, complaining actively. They just, um, I think that just through their normal operations, they're connecting different um, parts of their, their ownership you know, different equipment that all would function as, often would function as pipelines. And so that that could trigger this, even though it's it's wholly within. So most recently they were gonna put a pipeline um, to the north and connect into an existing pipeline, I believe. Um, and so it came from their main refinery facility and then went north and connected into something else. And so it would have been over the quarter mile or whatever the our standard is, but it's wholly within their property. And um, and they were just saying, see, this is just our, our normal course of operations, which I think is true that it is different than maybe Northern natural gas that's running across, you know, half the city. 
but the impacts really aren't any different. You know, you're you're digging and you're going across wetlands and roads and all that kind of stuff and, you know, potentially taking out trees. So I think we just want to raise it and see if there's some options that maybe make some sense um, that could, I don't know, maybe alleviate some of it because I, I'm, because they're still held to the standards, even if they don't go through the process. Right, so they'd still be required to have the permit, just not the public hearing. Right, that it, it'd go through with a grading permit and then like a right away permit. I mean, there's, yeah. But I also, I like um, Melissa's idea as well as, you know, if it has an impact into certain parameter of neighboring homes or properties. Then there should be more of a, a process, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've any other, any other comments or feedback for staff? It's really late and people aren't overly excited about this topic, <laughs> are they? Right. So I think maybe, yeah, maybe we, we, maybe if staff could think about some options on what it would mean. I, I my biggest concern is is making sure that it's it's triggered if there's neighboring properties within an appropriate distance. Um, because while we use Pine Bend as this example, it, I come back to what was said in the previous discussion too of Pine Bend might not be the only one. And then we've got right. another property owner doing it and they're like, but it's all within my property, but it's abutting next to some other property that you don't own. And um, it, you know, that, that public hearing process could be very helpful in that case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe if staff can like kind of put some thought into recommendations along those lines and just make sure we don't get ourselves in a, in a predicament. I think that's but, a, a good start. But provide some flexibility for, you know, personally, I don't want to see Flint Hills come in for a, for a public hearing on something that no one's going to show up for and um, really is unnecessary given what they're doing and where it is on their land. So just becomes more time for them and us and everybody else when it's going to just probably go through anyways. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, anything else? Anthony and Kim, we're good on that one to move forward then? Will we so. see the, do we see the, the amendment come back on removing the natural gas then and then it'll move to city council after that then? Right. Yeah, everything okay. we talked about will be coming back. Okay. And is there any other items for discussion? Okay, we've confirmed we'll have a July 28th meeting with our continuance tonight. Um, is there a mid-July meeting? July 14th, oh, okay. that would be? No, there will not be. Okay, perfect. What? Any other? Um, Madam Chair? Yes, Stephanie. Um, I did want to mention, since Kyle had mentioned in our, um, the Rosewood Center he, um, item, he had mentioned that the county is doing a Highway 42 visioning study with some input from the city as well. I did just want to mention that online they do have an interactive map that has the ability for the public to comment too. Perfect. And that's on our city's website or the county's website? It's on the county's website. Okay, so the county's website has an interactive map for the County Road 42 visioning study. Perfect. Any other discussion items or anything anyone would like to, to add before we adjourn? Okay, seeing none, I will adjourn the meeting for this evening at 9.58, not quite 10 o'clock. Meeting adjourned, have a good night, everybody. We will see you in a month. Thank you. Thanks. And we'll see you at City Hall. Yes.